Hey, today's program is sponsored by SunsetLakeSabadee.com. We're doing something special uh, with Sunset Lake Sabadee. Uh, Sunset Lake, Sebade, and the Majority Report are teaming up to turn America's most consumerist holiday. I guess um, we just had Black Friday and Cyber Monday, although today is Giving Tuesday. I don't know why we got to do this, but uh, all those different days. But the bottom line is with uh, Sunset Lake, Sebade, we are doing a, um, uh, we're creating a fundraising opportunity for a great organization, and here's how it works. If you visit sunsetlakesabaday.com until uh, tomorrow, this date this ends uh, tomorrow night, December first at eleven fifty nine p.m. Everything you don't need a coupon code. Everything is thirty to sixty percent off, and then if you order over a hundred dollars worth of uh, stuff, you will receive a free jar of their delicious sebade gummies. It's a $40 value, and it's for free. This is a great time to go load up on all of your Sebede goodies. The fudge, the coffee, the Arnica and uh, Sebede uh, rubs, the hand lotion, the tinctures, the tinctures with melatonin, the smokables, the keef, all of it, all of it. Now is the time to do it. No promo code needed. Products are already discounted on the website. Uh, you know how um, how much I love this company and this product. They have been incredibly supportive of the show, but they've also, almost more importantly to me, they've allowed me to sleep without having to take Ambien, uh, which has been a big deal for me. Sunset Lake uh, Sebede will donate 10% of the sales up until tomorrow night, and they've been going on for almost eight days now, to givedirectly.org. This is an international anti-poverty organization. It sends cash directly to those in need in extreme poverty and allows themselves to choose how to spend that money with dignity in a way that best suits their lives and their needs. You've heard me talk about uh, uh, Give Directly in the past, and... Sunset Lake was like, where where do you want to uh, earmark this to? Give directly was my choice based upon just all the data we've seen uh, in terms of how much giving directly just simply makes sense. Majority Report is going to match that 10% donation. So head over there, buy some Sabad A, and know that 10% of what you're doing plus another 10%, so really 20% of your purchase ultimately is going to go to givedirectly.org. Sunset Lake Sabbath Day is a majority employee-owned business. They've donated more than $16,000 this year to anti-drug war organizations, to animal shelters, to union strike funds, nature conservation, food pantries, and refugee resettlement organizations. Again, visit sunsetlakesabbath.com. Take advantage of these discounts and help the Majority Report raise money for a great organization Remember, sale ends December 1st. That is Wednesday. Tomorrow. Tomorrow at 11.59 p.m. Also, don't forget, Majority Live is where you get tickets for our Boston show. Fair warning, folks. I think we're done with the mezzanine. They've already started to sell uh, balcony seats. I don't know if it was because of the announcement that John Benjamin and Larry Murphy are going to be there, but uh, that may have done it. We're oh going to have God. more guests. Balcony but seats? That's a big crowd. It's going to be a big crowd. Uh. It's going to be a big crowd. Get there right now. MajorityLive.com. Don't miss out. This thing actually looks like we're going to get very close to selling out soon. MajorityLive.com. All right. Speaking of Majority Live, let's start this show. Which is live. The Majority Report. With Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> And I get the feeling you've been cheated.
It is Tuesday, November 30th, 2021. My name is Sam Steeter. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, David Wengro, professor of comparative or comparative archaeology at University College London and co-author of The Dawn of Everything, A New History of Humanity, written co-written with the late David Graeber. Also on the program today, U.S. braces for Omicron. CDC strengthens their booster recommendation. It appears that 16 and 17 year olds may be eligible within a week. A Trump appointed federal judge halts the vaccine mandate for health care workers in 10 Republican led states. <clears throat> Joe Manchin, remember him? Now saying, you ready for this? The new COVID variant is giving him reason to pause over the Build Back Better bill. Hmm, dog ate his homework. New documents show that Chris Cuomo was deeply involved in disgraced brothers Governor Cuomo's public defense. CNN, the ball is in your court. Mm -hmm. National Labor Relations Board orders a new election at the Bessemer Amazon plant in Alabama. Not sure that it's going to go any better than the first time, but at least it sets down a marker for what these companies can do to sway a vote. Trump's appeal of the January 6th evidence release to be heard today. In the U.S. Circuit Court, New York City opens two clean needle sites for the first time ever. Nine Democratic Congress people call for Steve Donzinger's release from jail as he enters his second month of confinement for contempt in a case involving Chevron oil. And lastly, Barbados dumps the queen becomes a republic all this and more on today's majority report welcome ladies and gentlemen thanks for joining us joining me as always emma vigland hello emma hello sam happy tuesday thank you very much Mm. you're looking very fall yeah i mean wintry almost i was gonna say this is my uh we don't have stitch fix on today but this is my stitch fix sweater Mm. yeah i like it i should have uh coordinated but i you know you kind of take the lead on the ads anyway yeah i'm uh i'm getting preemptive stage fright about about the live show it's a little bit early for that but uh it's it's that's certainly preemptive but yeah okay this is gonna (laughs) be a long gonna be a long uh 45 or 60 days 40 45 days for you. I yeah, think. I mean, I just, I feel like maybe if I kind of uh, stretch out the dosage of the stage fright, that on the night, maybe it won't be so bad. You're going to amateurize the stage fright on the uh, Majority Live show, right. January 16th in Boston. It's Hope it's like, not compounding. Yeah. yeah, it's like when you take a little bit of arsenic with your breakfast every morning, I'm saying this from succession, uh, in order to, to make sure that you have some some way to stave off poison if you're poisoned. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Well, that's an interesting way of looking forward to uh, that evening. But no, I'm excited. It's just when tickets. you said balcony seats, I'm like, oh, there's two tiers or there's multiple tiers and like a I lot of people are going to be looking be three, at me. three, actually. Sorry? I think there might be three. I think we already did like the floor and cool. the mezzanine. I don't know how it works. Uh, but folks, you can get your tickets over at majorityalive.com. Uh, also, let me just get this out of the way. Yes, I have brought back the sweater vest. I think last year I did not wear one. Uh, through winter. Why? Um, I don't know why. Mm. I, I can't remember. Maybe I did. Didn't feel right. It didn't feel right. But I, it's back. It's here. If you have suggestions for where I can get sweater vests, because these are old, they're getting a little bit, a uh, little bit, a little bit beat up. I noticed today. Um, let me know, because it's hard to find a sweater vest now. You've got a trunk in a attic somewhere more or less you basically I, you maybe you you wore it uh, out of protest until cnn got rid of rick santorum right? no 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 uh, rick santorum had nothing to do with it he he usurped my usage of the uh 
of the sweater vest. Understood. Uh, one other thing, a uh, house cleaning note. We are uh, getting towards our annual best of week that is at the end of December. If you have a suggestion for a best of interview uh, that we did this year, send us an email at majorityreporters at gmail.com. Put in the subject line, best of. And we will tally up uh, the results and may or may not actually take your suggestions. So there it is. Uh, get on that. In the meantime, um, more and more, it is looking like uh, this winter is going to be, um, in some respects, dominated by uh, Omicron. I was just listening to uh, New York has declared a state of emergency, uh, which allows essentially uh, funds to be diverted. It sounds a little bit more extreme than it actually is, but the frank, it, the, the numbers are going up. We still have it. We have a state that is, you know, more than two thirds vaccinated, but it's a big state. And to have a third of people unvaccinated, I mean, excuse me, more than uh, three quarters vaccinated, to have, um, you know, 25% of the population unvaccinated, it's creating problems. Uh, just in, I think it's Ulster County, which is right up uh, the, the 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 Hudson River, not you know between here and Albany. The number of hospitalized people, and we're talking you know tens of people, not hundreds, because it's it's small county, but it but it's quadrupled over the past month. Yeah, and it's cold. People are going inside. People are you know they're not wearing masks in the way that they used to. For all we know, Omicron is already here, but it's hard to say. Um, and so uh, this is going to become, I think, more of an issue. Uh, here is a Joe Biden press conference. And I think in many respects, they're still wrestling with like how you approach this. I was listening to an interview of a county supervisor in Ulster County this morning. Don't ask me why. And he's like, I, I don't know if I can if I'm going to do the, the mandate, the indoor masks. And the only reason why he's not, he's even contemplating not doing it is because there are morons in this country that when they hear mandate of masks, that makes them wear masks less and they make an issue of it. And then they becomes, a, you know, so he's like, I'm trying to figure out, I mean, this is the, it's like dealing with a child, but right? This is, if you but, make a rule and they, and then they, they'll be more likely to rebel against it. Yes. And, and look, this is, you know, People are as people are, but this is the challenge of public health policy. It is not simply the, the science says you should wear masks, so we're going to mandate masks. The science says masks help. There's arguments as to they help uh, reduce transmission by 10% or is it 40% or is it 50%? How much do the very different uh, quality masks uh, implicate? But the bottom line is it's greater than zero in terms of its e efficacy. And so you want anything that will be an obstacle to transmission. But then the question is like, how do you get people to wear masks? And so, uh, but here is Joe Biden uh, talking about the administration's strategy in dealing with COVID. Yeah, no, I, I'm not an Alex, but I'd love to ask one question. The other Alex. Okay, yeah. let me ask the other Alex and then you. <laughs> sure. Um, Mr. President, uh, is this the new normal that Americans should expect anticipating future uh, potential variants? Should we expect intermittent travel restrictions and potential drops in the stock market going forward? Do you have any words of reassurance that this won't become the new normal? And then for both you and Dr. Fauci, Dr. Fauci said earlier on CBS that uh, lockdowns, shutdowns are off, off the table for uh, restraining COVID going forward. You said that won't be part of your plan on Thursday. But why is that? Why are you taking that off the table? Well, to answer your first question first, uh, the answer is I expect this not to be the new normal. I expect the new normal to be everyone ends up getting vaccinated in the booster shot. So we reduce the number of people who aren't protected to such a low degree that we're not seeing the spread of these viruses. Now, we remain to be seeing exactly what the elements of this particular strain are. But if they're as I hope, then it's not going to be fundamentally different than in the past. Um, and uh, 
in terms of uh, what was the second part of the question? Are lockdowns off the table? Is yes, for now. Uh, yes. Dr. Why, why is that? Well, because we're able to, if people are vaccinated and wear their masks, there's no need for the lockdown. Yes, so, um, My last question. Go, yes, going on from, from that question, uh, we've got the Christmas period coming up, huge amount of travel. Um, would you give any thought to domestic flights requiring test or vaccine before people get on planes the same way as they do for international flights? Well, at this point, that's not been recommended. I would make for my uh, the scientific community to give, give me a recommendation on that. Are travel restrictions too late to be effective, sir, given that Dr. Fauci says this new variant could already be here? You understand the point of the, of the travel of the restriction to give us time to get people to get protection, to be vaccinated and get the booster. That's the reason for it. Thank you all so very. I mean, that's the bottom line. The uh, and and I think there's a legitimate argument that these travel restrictions um, unfairly target uh, places that desperately need help in terms of economic help. Uh, but they're all they're only just trying to buy a couple like uh, literally a couple of days and 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 I think they probably already know that it's here. It's just a question of and there's probably already community spread, but just like how many different community spreads do you want to seed at any point? That's really what it comes down to. Um, and but but the uh, the the bottom line is you, you get these um, rulings from, you know, a Trump appointed lawyer to hold off on the vaccine mandate for healthcare workers. On some level, you're trying to um, stop a, a a leaky dam with I don't know with like a, a sieve. band aid. Yeah, a band aid or a sieve for yeah. that matter. So um, that's the situation. Great question about the stock market, though, right? Important, important question. But it's also just sort of like, uh, what is he going to say? What's he going to? We've no. decided to mandate that the stock market stay high. He's like, oh, I forgot to push the big red button that keeps the stock market booming. My bad. Um, it's. Uh, and it, by the way, just just to say, talk about make this one point about vaccines. New York City had zero COVID-related deaths yesterday over 90 percent vaccination and like that's because it's basically impossible to live your life in the city right now when you're not vaccinated you have to show a vax card anywhere you go yep so like just more evidence to show these things work all right a couple of sponsors of the program today if you're a business owner it can be tough to hire a top talent for your team uh, don't i know it especially when you're competing with other businesses to find the right people so how do you get the hiring edge? ZipRecruiter.com. They have an invite to apply feature that lets you, as the employer, invite the best candidates to apply for your open positions. And now you can try for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash majority. When you post a job on ZipRecruiter, you start getting the most qualified people sent to you very quickly. Then you can easily review recommended candidates, invite your top choices, ask them to apply, with only one click. Apparently, next key marketing manager, Erin Hartje, she loves the invite to apply. I haven't talked to her directly about this, but that's what I am told. She says they get my job posting in front of the right people. That's basically what happened when we got Brendan on the program. And then Bradley came from Brendan. It's, I mean, that's the way it works. Uh, according to ZipRecruiter internal data, on average for 2020, jobs where employers use ZipRecruiter's invite to apply get two and a half times more candidates. Take it from Aaron, or you could take it from me. But Aaron says you can basically tell ZipRecruiter who you need, when you need it, and they deliver. I would have said the same thing. Yeah. Hey, see for yourself. Just go to this exclusive web address, ZipRecruiter.com slash majority. M-A-J-O-R-I-T-Y. ZipRecruiter.com slash majority. ZipRecruiter, it's the smartest way to hire. And lastly, if you're looking for opportunities to skip the trip to the post office, dodge all that hectic holiday shopping traffic, well, you can save time and money with Stamps.com. Stamps.com lets you compare rates, prints labels, Access exclusive discounts on UPS and U.S. Postal Service services all year long. Look, it just makes sense, especially if your business sends more mail and packages during the holidays. Doesn't matter whether you're selling online or you're running an office or any type of like side hustle, sending out DVDs like I did back in the day to members. I ran out. 
Stamps.com can save you so much time and money and stress during the holidays, and God knows we need less stress. Access all the post office and UPS shipping services you need without taking the trip, and you get discounts. And you get discounts you can't find anywhere else. It's like up to 40% off of U.S. Postal Service rates and 76% off of UPS rates. And if you spend more than a few minutes a week dealing with the mail and shipping, Stamps.com is a lifesaver. You can do this 24-7, 365. Just get on your computer. Uh, it, it makes it just much easier. Save time and money this holiday season with Stamps.com. Sign up with promo code Majority Report for a special offer that includes a four-week trial Free postage, and you ready for this? A digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the page, enter code majority report. That is code majority report. Okay, I want to uh, welcome to the program David Wengro. He is a professor of uh, uh, comparative archaeology at the University College London. He is the co-author of The Dawn of Everything, A New History of Humanity, with the late David Graber. Um, uh, David, it's a real pleasure to have you on the program. We had um, uh, David Graber on at least a, uh, two or three times over the years, and I found particularly debt uh, for me was uh, incredibly enlightening, and it's it's a real pleasure to have you here. Uh, this book obviously uh, published, um, you guys had, had just about finished it, is my understanding, and, and published posthumously after um, uh, David Graber passed. But uh, welcome to the show. I'm, I'm here with Emma Vigland. Thanks so much. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Okay, so let, let's start. This is, I was, I was talking to Matt before the show saying, this is tough. This is tough stuff because it's, you've got three, like, sort of uh, major um, uh, academic um, sort of silos here, archaeology, anthropology, and in an intellectual history that has... And there's a different mix, I guess, that has developed a um, an accepted, for the most part, worldview as to how humans have developed and and developed our societies. So, and so, I'm going to ask you maybe to be a little bit remedial um, for, for for our sake. But 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 walk us through what the prevailing story has been. Mm -hmm. um, of yeah. the development of, of, of human society. We're talking about what's often called the broad sweep of human history, mm -hmm. right? And our current picture of the broad sweep of human history was invented long before my discipline of archaeology even really existed, let alone the discipline of anthropology. You can find it, you can find the germ of it in things that were written over 200 years ago, even over 300 years ago years ago, in the writings of philosophers like Thomas Hobbes in England, Jean-Jacques Rousseau in France, who were what were called at the time state of nature theorists, which means that they allowed themselves to speculate on what we were like, what our species was like in its original form, you know, what was that kind of original protoplasmic mass of humanity really like, what kind of, did they have religion, did they have marriage customs, it was pure speculation, and they were very open about the fact that it was speculative. And these stories which they told were in many ways parables for their own time. You know, Hobbes was living in a time of great conflict, the English Civil War. He told a story about how humanity was originally just like that, uh, a state of war of all against all. And it was part of the way that he reasoned out a justification for the creation of states and strong kingdoms as a way of limiting violence. Um, Rousseau told a different story a few decades before the French Revolution. He told the story about how humanity before civilization was a society of equals. Uh, and in that society of equals, people were happy. They were also kind of innocent. They didn't have very much yet in terms of material goods or technical knowledge. And then something happened to change all that. Uh, people started planting crops, and from prop crops came the principle of private property. That's a mouthful. Um, and from that come, uh, comes uh, uh, territoriality. Uh, populations grow. We get cities, kingdoms, and empires. And eventually we end up with this very familiar story of civilization, which is kind of an ambivalent 
tail. On the one hand, things get better, we get progress, we get agriculture, we get metallurgy, we get the arts and sciences and philosophy. But with every advance, we fall backwards in the domain of human freedoms and equality. So for Rousseau, we start equal. But with every new invention, with every step uh, forwards, um, we become more trapped in our chains, as he puts it. So it's all a story which illustrates his famous point, you know, man is born free, but everywhere we find him in chains. And these two stories have, have had an extraordinary effect on the thinking of serious scholars right down to the present day. They've commanded the attention of social scientists, philosophers, people in my own field, who have a huge amount of knowledge and scientific facts at their disposal. But when they go after that holy grail, you know, they try to capture that broad sweep of human history. What we notice, David and I, is that they, they sort of slip back into these structures of thought, which go all the way back to Hobbes and Rousseau. So we're dealing here with some really powerful, tenacious, we would say, myths. Can, can I just want to tease out that structure of thought with Hobbes and Rousseau and mm. almost like a take a 30,000 uh, foot view of what they're saying, because they're ostensibly at, at, at odds with each other on some level, but they're almost like the two sides of one coin in that yes. they have a, a, a modality of progression that they are both espousing that is similar. Can you just speak on that so that we understand how once you buy whichever side of that coin you buy, you're sort of falling into the same, you, you've already then limited. Uh, yeah, you, you end up roughly in the same place, which is in a place where hierarchy and domination are the inevitable effect of societies getting larger and more complex. It's just that with Hobbes, you start off with sort of chaos and anarchy in his sense, and, and, and then you need those hierarchical structures to control it, to kind of tame those disruptive, competitive base instincts. With Rousseau, you get to the same end point, but you just start uh, from the other, <laughs> the other end of the spectrum. So you start in happiness and innocence, but it's actually the process of societies forming and a complex division of labor and technology that is paradoxically what, what is supposed to trap us in our chains. But either way, you end up in chains. And they're, and they're both a story of inevitability on some level, level as a function of, of human nature. Yeah, they both start with uh, uh, what is conceptualized as a, a, a single fixed uh, human condition, and then something changes and we're set on a kind of linear path uh, towards roughly where we are now. And so, and I guess the... Um, the, the project of of the, the a new history of humanity is to attempt to impose to start to not use uh, Rousseau and Hobbes as a primary assumption and then work from there, but instead to use evidence that we found archaeological and and uh, arguably anthropological evidence to reevaluate that story. Well, thinking back, it was actually a messier process because our original intention was to feed into those debates. I mean, the Rousseau story was actually the answer to an essay competition set by a French academy in the town of Dijon in 1753. And that was really one of the first times that people posed the question, what is the origin of social inequality in human societies? And is it a natural, is it authorized by nature? Is it, is it a natural condition. And people are still asking that question. And when David and I started working on this project, we saw ourselves as contributing to that ongoing discussion. But in the process, we came to realize that the question is a kind of trap, and we found ourselves falling into it. Because by even framing the big questions of human history that way, in terms of origins, what is the origin of inequality? What is the origin of private property? What is the origin of the state? You already you're automatically sort of back in that kind of linear mode of thought, where once upon a time we assume there was something else, something before inequality, and then something changed, so you get inequality. It already fixes you in a certain way of thinking, which actually wasn't working. I mean, it wasn't matching the evidence that we see in our own fields today. 
from all these modern investigations. So we actually had to do something else. We had to actually start questioning the origins of the question about the origins of inequality in order to even conceptualize the kind of material that we now have at our disposal. And, and, and that uh, brought you to the indigenous critique. And, yeah. and, and I mean, explain to us, this, this is um, the, the, the argument as I understand it is yeah. that what we know as the European enlightenment and yeah. we're talking about sort of the, a, a big change in the, the, I guess the, uh, the understanding of, of the world in many respects that took place in the 1600s and 1700s in intellectual thought um, was 18th, yeah, 18th century, yeah. 18th century um, was a function uh, in many respects of what French missionaries learned from indigenous people. Well, we're not we're not saying that the entirety of the Enlightenment started there, but there are some very fundamental Enlightenment concepts, um, really mainly revolving around ideas about freedoms, social freedoms, and equality, which we do argue that that the way those ideas developed in European intellectual circles was profoundly influenced by the colonial encounter between mainly French colonists and the indigenous peoples of what's now the Great Lakes region of Canada, sort of down to upstate New York and over to Newfoundland. Um, and this, this is a story which we tell in one of the early chapters of the book. We knew it would be a provocative story. We say so in the book. Um, but we're not the first ones to tell it, and, and we stand by it. Will you, will you just, um, uh, you know, um, uh, just uh, give us a little teaser on that story? Yeah, I mean, it mainly involves these two characters. Okay, so what, what we need to establish is that around that time, the early 18th century, there's a genre of literature which becomes incredibly popular in Europe. It's often referred to as savage dialogues, and it, it, it generally involves a, uh, a European author uh, and an, uh, an exotic uh, interlocutor who is often a completely sort of fancy character. Uh, it might be a, a Peruvian princess, or a Persian or a Tahitian or whatever it may be. And most of the major Enlightenment thinkers, particularly in France, Voltaire, Diderot and the rest, wrote these kind of dialogues. And in them, the exotic interlocutor usually gives a, a, a critique of European uh, uh, behavior, of European civilization. Um, there is a text which we know inspired a lot of these kind of savage dialogues, which was written by somebody who actually had been to the French colonies and spent many years there. Uh, he went around by the name of the Baron La Hontan, and in 1703, he published his Curious Dialogues with a Wise Savage, which features a character called Adario, who historians generally accept is based on a real person, a member of the Huron-Wendat Huron nation, very prominent member of that uh, nation, uh, who was called Candiaronk. He was one of the signatories of the Great Peace of Montreal in 1701, and he was famous in the region as a, a warrior and a diplomat, but also as a brilliant speaker and just an extremely smart person. The French governor at the time, a man by, uh, by the name of Frontignac, would uh, invite Candiaronk to his table to entertain his officers by engaging him in these debates. So we're not talking here about Disney's Pocahontas, right? We're talking about two people whose lives we know about, uh, who met each other, and who, who had one of many thousands of interactions that were going on at the time between European colonists and Native American peoples. But the standard way of looking at these dialogues in European history is to say they're completely invented, totally fictitious. It's a dialogue between a European and himself with the, the exotic interlocutor is like a sock puppet, like a muppet, through which the European speaks back at himself and says naughty things about his own society that might get him into trouble. You get the picture. Uh, that's the standard way of looking at all of these dialogues, including La Hontance. In that early chapter, we question this. We look at other accounts by Jesuit missionaries who were actually very hostile to many of these 
indigenous nations. They were critical. They were trying to convert them to Christianity. And we show how many of the words that La Hontan puts in the mouth of Adario are actually very consistent with the way that Wendat societies were organized at the time. Uh, and also very consistent with the, the observations that a whole range of Iroquoian and Algonquin and Montanese and Escapi peoples had of Europeans at the time. They thought we were obsessed with money. They were a bit puzzled by our love of hierarchy and the fact that we have kings and bow down to each other all the time, but at the same time that we're very competitive with each other and we'll let our, our own people fall through the cracks. You know, they were quite scandalized by things like homelessness, uh, which they saw a lot of in colonial towns. Some of them came to Europe. It's quite likely that Candiaronk himself came to Paris, although we can't quite establish that. So um, you may be wondering why this is all so central um, to the book, but it, it did become really central to the way that we reconceptualize that whole question. What began as the origins of inequality was originally a dialogue about freedom. And I, so, I mean, um, the the idea being that there were concepts that were introduced to Europe that heretofore had been attributed to Europeans themselves. Like this no, is, yeah. I mean, it's more than concepts because you know the concepts were already there. You can probably find them in a whole bunch of stories from ancient Greece or even in the Bible. Um, they were there as ideas, but they were just one set of ideas among a whole bunch of others. Um, but what was different about that colonial counter is that Europeans, for the first time, actually encountered whole societies that were constructed on some of these principles. You know, they didn't have prisons and judges, but their crime rates were actually lower uh, than in France at the time. So this was a concrete example, you know, a model. They had women's rights that were way ahead of those in Europe at the time. Women could get divorced. There were sexual freedoms that were unheard of. Um, so... It's, it's much more of a shock than just reading something in a book. You know, these people are real. And so what are, what are the implications? I mean, if it is the case that um, these ideas were, and practices really, uh, mm. uh, pre-existed, um, at least in terms of the way the European thought did. I mean, it undercuts, obviously, the idea that uh, Rousseau had and that Hobbes had, um, and, and uh, yes, it's interesting. It, it, in a way, it does the opposite. It, it almost creates those ideas. This is a little involved, but let me try and, and, and explain how we explain it in the book. Um, these models of, of freedom, of an alternative way of living, were gaining ground in Europe um, at that time. Remember, we are just a few decades away from the French Revolution. And they're gaining ground in intellectual circles where um, there are thinkers of different stripes, some are more conservative than others. One of these thinkers uh, is the economist, uh, Anne-Robert Thiergaud, who, along with Adam Smith in Scotland, really invented the basis of that whole story that we're all familiar with now, where you tell the human story in terms of hunter-gatherers, farmers, uh, and then urban, commercial, industrial. In other words, modes of production or modes of livelihood is the basic way of organizing and structuring human history. But where does that whole idea come from? We actually have a fascinating set of correspondences between Thiergo uh, and a French novelist, uh, a woman called uh, Graffini, Madame Graffini, who wrote the Letters from a Peruvian Woman, where she takes many of the sentiments to be found in La Hontan's book and puts them in the mouth of a completely imaginary Inca princess. But you get the same scathing criticisms of monarchy and hierarchy and uh, rapaciousness. Um, and she shows this to Tilgo, who's a bit alarmed by it. You know, this is, this is a bit dangerous, a bit subversive. He tries to get her to change the ending of the book uh, so it becomes less subversive. She ignores him, publishes it. And over the next few years, Tilgo publishes his own essays on world history, where he does something really, really interesting. He takes that indigenous critique and all these ideas about freedom, and he shoves them down to the bottom of a kind of ladder of evolution through which societies can develop. I mean, what he's saying here basically is that if these uh, 
remote exotic peoples can have such freedoms, can have such equality, it's not because they're superior to us. It's actually because they're inferior to us. And what he means by that is inferior in their technological capacity and in their material wealth. And uh, the basic point is that in order to progress up that scale of advancement towards modern industrial societies, you have to leave all that other stuff at the bottom. So Kandyarank and everything he stood for, at best, in Tilgo's scheme, at best can tell us about remote ages in the distant past of humanity. It's no longer a relevant critique to the way we organize our own lives and our own societies. So you see what he did there. And we're still thinking on those lines, you know, when anthropologists pluck an example here and there of a hunter-gatherer group, which is fiercely egalitarian, and they say, oh, this is what the original condition of humanity was like. There's still a lot of research on those lines, and it's very in interesting research, but the basic procedure was invented by Tilgo. So he shoves a, a critique of, of hierarchy into a hier hierarchical Into structure. a hierarchy, yeah. It's clever, isn't it? Well, I mean, and it's also, I mean, th there's got to be just implicit racism um, in this, right, as well? Totally. It's I totally mean, racist. Yeah. But, I mean, this is, I guess, a little bit an aside. I mean, as somebody who works in these academic fields, I mean, it's it's got to be more common than understood that a lot of these analyses or anthropological understandings of 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 even modern cultures are so inherently in that very structure that you mention here. Yeah, in the book, um, we call it the myth of the stupid savage. You know, we've all heard of the myth of the noble savage, but you don't really find that in Rousseau. You certainly don't find it in these 17th century missionary accounts. They're not romanticizing uh, anybody. They're, they're, they're quite alarmed and, 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 um, and disgusted by the sort of well, the wicked liberty of the savages, you know. Um, what Rousseau does invent uh, is, is this other kind of myth of um, people who, insofar as they are egalitarian uh, or living happy lives, are doing it in this kind of weird parallel universe where, you know, they can't really think about what they're doing. They can't understand what are the consequences of their own actions. Oh, God, we've invented agriculture. Now we're trapped. We didn't see that coming. And the whole story that you get um, and which you still get in some best-selling books about world history, is that our ancestors were just a bit dumb. And of course, in the 19th century, this does get rationalized as eugenics and racism. And what's really interesting, there's, there's a very important book by an anthropologist called Tara Ellingson, which is about where the idea of the noble savage really comes from. And it really comes from a clique of total racists who took over the British Ethnological Society in the Victorian period, and who had figured out that if you want to dismiss the idea that Europeans actually may have learned something of moral value, of social value from native indigenous peoples, a very effective way of doing it is to actually say, oh, you're romanticizing. You're telling noble savage stories. It's really, it's, it's more complicated, I think, than, than certainly than we realized when we got into it. But it's a fascinating story about how, what looks like almost a post-colonial perspective. You know, stop romanticizing the other, stop romanticizing what's exotic, actually ends up doing the opposite and, and shutting down the possibility that you may have had cultural dialogue or cross-cultural influence. It's complicated, but it's also kind of familiar. And so ultimately, it served uh, the, 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 it was almost, I guess, um, it was almost reverse engineered. How do we explain this contemporary alternative to the way that we're living? Well, we explain it because they're actually not as developed as we are. And, and, right. and so therefore, it becomes less of a threat because time can't go backwards. We can't, uh, we cannot... We cannot, um, we cannot return to the, the Garden of Eden, as it were. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you end up with all those debates that we've all had a million times. Somebody says, well, if you want a more equal society, you're going to have to you know, somehow undo the Industrial Revolution, get rid of mobile phones, get rid of all that technology, 
kill 95% of the people on the planet and go back to living in small groups, <laughs> like hunter gatherers. I mean, you know, it's exactly the logic. So, okay. So with, with, with the idea that as an intellectual, um, as in terms of like, with having set, I guess the, the, the terms that the, the development of the idea of our development, uh, may have been, um, uh, less innocent in some respects, I guess, than, than, than we have all been led to believe. Um, you, you go on to begin to present essentially physical evidence right. that undercuts the, the theory of our own development. Um, right. like what is, um, what, what are some of the, the those, those key tent poles? I mean, I know at one point, mm -hmm. You talk about the difference between uh, indigenous people in uh, Northern California versus Canada. As it, but, but you you tell me what you think are the most important um, sort of tent poles that begin to deconstruct the uh, the, the physical um, uh, argument uh, of our development. Well, that's a that's a good example. It's and we think it's an important one. Um, it's it comes more out of anthropology than archaeology. Um, actually, we begin with more archaeological cases. So we take the evidence as far back as we feel we can. We don't want to get into that whole game of just speculating on the basis of no evidence. You know, the human species has been around. We think for at least 200,000 years. And it's generally thought that for all of that period, uh, cognitively our brains were functioning more or less as they do now, which is kind of mind blowing when you think that we actually have very little evidence for what was going on for most of that time. So we really begin our story where the evidence becomes rich enough, plentiful enough for us to actually begin to infer things about human social organization, which we think is roughly around the time of the last ice age, about 30,000 years ago. Now, according to the conventional wisdom, this is still long before agriculture. We should be expecting basically one form of hunter-gatherer society, probably a small egalitarian society, no private property, no classes or ranks. Is that what we see? Not at all. If we look at the archaeological record of Europe, not because there was anything particularly special about Europe, it's just that European countries are very wealthy and they've been doing archaeology for a long time, so we know more about it. Um, what we see, among other things, are these burials, which are really fascinating. And we get them all over the continent, all the way from Russia over to France and the Dordogne, burials of individuals who look like they're buried like kings and queens. They've got all this personal wealth, this jewelry hanging off them, thousands of ornaments and beads, big ceremonial weapons and regalia. So what are they doing there in a period where we're supposed to have egalitarian hunter-gatherers? And there are even more interesting things about them. For example, we know from the uh, physical remains of their skeletons that a weird percentage, something like 70% of them, were people who today would be classed as disabled or as having you know, very obvious physical features that differentiate them. They're either very tall, very short, uh, congenital deformities, this kind of thing, um, like a non-random percentage of these rich burials. And then you realize also that there's nothing else apart from the burials to suggest that this is a a heavily ranked hierarchical society. So it's like the kings and queens only exist in, in the burial, in the funeral, in the ritual. So immediately you've got something way more complicated going on. You've got a society that performs a kind of ceremonial pageant of aristocracy or inequality or class uh, at, in certain contexts, perhaps at certain times of year. I mean, we're talking about Ice Age societies living on the ton, you know, on the edge of glaciers. These are very seasonal environments. You have uh, seasonal migrations of woolly mammoth and deer and horses and other animals. So these are societies that we argue were actually morphing. They were switching around their structures, uh, often within the same year, often from hierarchical to egalitarian. And there are lots of examples of this in the uh, anthropological literature of hunter-gatherer societies. Uh, from the circumpolar region, from the Canadian Northwest Coast, they would actually flip their whole political structure around and their legal system and their, even their religious system uh, once or twice a year. They would almost just become a totally different society. 
And it often went together with people coming together in large groups and then dispersing. And you suddenly realize, well, it's, it's the opposite of our conventional story, where there's meant to be this baseline form of humanity, which is fixed and stable, and then comes agriculture and changes all that, so it can never work the same again. Well, no, what we find are actually very experimental societies that are already trying things on for size. You know, they're trying out uh, uh, inequality class, probably private property as well, but they're not getting fixed in any one system. Is there, um, I mean, I have, I have two separate uh, questions there. Is there, what, what is it that necessarily means that if I happen to be someone that, that my clan or decides should be buried with all these ornate things, mm. that is necessarily hierarchical? Right. I mean, like, I, I don't know, you could look at, yeah. at a basketball team and say, like, who's more who's on the hierarchy here, the, the forward or the. the, the yeah, yeah. Right. You, have a, you have a good point. Actually, we talk in the book about um, indigenous societies in California, which were hunter gatherers, but the, they, they were not also not at all egalitarian in the sense that people imagine. Actually, they were very interested in money. Uh, you know, the, like many indigenous societies, they had their own forms of money. Um, and um, the, the men in particular uh, used to accumulate large amounts of it, but it, it wasn't passed on through generations. So actually when somebody died, they put all the wealth in the grave, so it looks like a, a rich, you know, wealthy, but actually the effect was to level things out. So you had to take it with you. You couldn't pass it on to your kids. They had to make their own way in life and make their own reputations. Maybe that's what we're dealing with in the Ice Age. Very interesting possibility. But look, we're already talking about sophisticated people, people like us, people making decisions about what it means to have more wealth than somebody else and shaping their rituals, shaping their societies in accordance with that. We're not talking anymore about these kind of card, cardboard cutout cartoon characters that are usually presented as our ancestors. Isn't there also a, an incentive for anthropological researchers, not like yourself, but some, you know, s some of the people we're looking at here to mm -hmm. center themselves as the evolved species and the uh, the society that has it figured out and thus kind of othering their s subjects as, mm. uh, as, as less so, because there is a, there's a narcissism there that might just be also like inherently human and needed, needing to be as, uh, yeah. made aware. I often, I often think of it the other way around is that, you know, the way we put people down is to pre pretend that they're not aware of their own problems and issues that, you know, they live in these kind of total social worlds where, you know, they're, they're almost automatically obeying customs and traditions um, and sort of unreflective, whereas we have all these existential crises and problems and, uh, you know, we worry about things like gender and inequality, but they just live their lives according to a pattern. So it's weird. It's, again, it's kind of reverse snobbery. Um, mm -hmm. says because they've kind of got it all sorted out they're they're primitive whereas you know we're advanced enough and the, you know the, this is partly what we try to show in the book i mean in a way it's central is that there's never been a time like that when people weren't aware of exactly the same kind of deep paradoxes that, that we worry about all the time mortality inequality um it's just that they had a far greater range of often very creative ways of dealing with those um, than we give ourselves credit for, or than we do. So, so just to go back on the on the idea that um, a, a a clan, if you will, a group, could at different times of the year, it may be temporal, it may be just sort of like uh, circumstantial, sure. uh, yeah. where where you know uh, they come together uh, with other groups and decide we're going to, for the sake of facilitating this situation, create. Uh, some form of hierarchy or some type of system, and then we're going to disband it because we're not going to, we don't want to impose this on ourselves over in a long period of time. But you can imagine what it would be like to do that all the time. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, exactly. And 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 we we have a certain task to do, and it may be more suited for this task or mm -hmm. this gathering than something else. There's the uh, another parallel to this that you 
discuss is the idea of like post flood farming that oh, yeah. agriculture. Yeah. I mean, talk about that because that seems to be again, a similar circumstance, which would indicate that our ancestors had the ability to sort of say like, we're gonna, this makes sense for now, but it doesn't necessarily make sense for later. And that's indicative of, or that cuts against this idea that there was sort of some type of like flow of development that they were just, you know, passively following. Yeah, I'm really happy you bring that up because the the, the great work on that was done in, by my former teacher in Oxford, a brilliant guy uh, called Andrew Scherer, it's a prehistorian. He wrote about this phenomenon of floodwater farming, which is what a lot of the earliest Neolithic agriculture seems to have been like. Um, it's almost the exact opposite of what Rousseau imagined. You know, he imagined that you've got land and, and, and somebody comes and stakes out a fence and then you've got a field and in the field you plant your crops and that's it, it's your, it's your land, your property. Actually, um, a lot of early Neolithic farming um, took the form of going to the edge of a river or a lake which flooded seasonally, um, like the Nile used to do until they built the Aswan High Dam. So you get the floods and then the waters recede and you've got a, a, a very uh, naturally irrigated uh, uh, patch of soil, very fertile patch of soil. But of course it's not the same every year. You know, the waters don't obey some kind of strict law of territoriality same bit of land may be flooded one year, maybe swamp the next year, maybe dry the next year. So you could put a fence around it, but it wouldn't do you very much good. <laughs> Come back the next, here's my farming land, it is dry. Um, and the other thing about it is that it's kind of sloppy farming. You know, you don't need to actually prepare the land. Uh, Yuval Harari in his book, uh, uh, Sapiens, talks about how farming trapped us and the wheat, you know, growing the wheat meant that we had to labor in the fields and we had to bring the water to the fields. No, we didn't have to bring the water. If you know about prehistory, you know that's not how it worked at all. The water was there and nature was actually doing a lot of the toil. So it's, it's a rather sort of lazy form of uh, cereal agriculture, um, which means you can combine it with other things. So a lot of these early farming societies were not just farming, they were also hunting, fishing, foraging a whole range of wild plant resources. They were very uh, diverse in their, their economic pursuits, which is very different from saying that there was an agricultural revolution where we went from being hunter-gatherers to something else. And, and you also uh, write about a pre-agricultural uh, settlements that existed in Japan and had a certain yeah. amount of uh, complexity. Uh, uh, talk about that. And, and then, you know, I want to start to like, Mm -hmm. Talk about the implications of these, what would otherwise be, I mean, that, that are supposedly anomalous to the story that we've been told. But, but in well, fact, Japan, Japan, before the coming of rice farming, um, had a hunter gatherer civilization called uh, the Jomon. Um, which lasted for over 10,000 years. A lot of things happened in those 10,000 years. You have phases with monuments that go up. These are, these are societies that relied for food on mainly fishing and nut gathering. Um, you have phases with rich aristocratic burials. There's a famous, uh, well, if you're Japanese, it's famous uh, heritage site called Sane Maruyama, which was a kind of hunter-gatherer center, almost a hunter-gatherer city with big storage buildings where they'd store up all their nuts and acorns very, very remote from the idea of a simple egalitarian society. They probably had more egalitarian phases. They also seem to have uh, used cannabis, interestingly, uh, not just for rope, but also for, to, to smoke. Um, so, you know, this is a, a, a rich and fascinating, and they produced a pottery style, which is apparently also the basis for the graphics on the Nintendo game, uh, Zelda. It was a famous video game, they tell me. And it's got these kind of rope design graphics, which the designer took from the Jomon pottery. Uh, so the Jomon actually have a digital afterlife. So, I mean, if we take the 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 aggregate of of these sort of, I guess, physical um, refutations of the way uh, of the uh, of the story of how we developed, like what does that 
what does that mean? I mean, it, it, have we created? I mean, have we, what it means to me. Well, yes. I mean, uh, uh, what does that mean to you? I mean, we, we've there's this, we have been um, told, and to find out that it's not the case, what are the implications uh, of that? I guess. Yeah. I think a lot of this comes down to the, um, you know, like the function of the other story, the conventional story. Um, the famous French anthropologist Claude Lévi-Strauss had a, a, a theory about myths and why certain myths persist, um, which was really about the functions they fulfill in society. So what a myth really does is it, it takes a paradox, something we can't resolve, and just by telling the story, it kind of tries to mediate between these things. So man is born free, but everywhere we find him in chains. Let's tell a story about why that is necessarily the case. And what we say in the book is that the conventional telling of, of human history, apart from being factually wrong and frankly just a bit boring after 300 years, is also politically quite dismal because it tells us that as human societies grow in size and complexity, uh, radical inequality is inevitable. We might tweak and adjust it a little bit, but, but it, it's, it's what we have because, because it's what we have and there's no way out. Um, and if you keep telling yourself those kind of stories and teaching your kids those kind of stories in school, that's not without consequence. So um, what it means to puncture that myth um, is a that we can get closer to the evidence we can get closer to a, an accurate scientific understanding of our species past but also b uh, we can reevaluate our capacities as human beings what does it mean to be a human being this is the basic question of anthropology and what the evidence tells us now is that there's a whole set of possibilities out there that were way beyond the philosophies of rousseau and hobbes and, and probably also beyond most of our philosophies. And so if ultimately the way that we've organized societies today was a choice that was not inevitability because of the exactly. nature of, of, of human beings, what, and, and maybe, you know, I know that uh, you and, and Graber had intended to write a couple more volumes, uh, yeah. but why, why did we make these choices? I mean, what was yeah, this is the how we got stuck question, which we go into in the book. But I've realized as I talk to more people about it, this is what a lot of readers want to hear more of. So I'll, I'll basically um, I'll, I'll try to give an indication without completely spoiling the book. Uh, people who haven't read it. But insofar as we are answer that question, it's about what we're left with when you strip away the old story about, oh, agriculture created inequality, living in cities created inequality. No, we show empirically that this is simply not the case. So what, what we're left with, as you say, is people making choices. And the question is why some of those choices did lead uh, to patriarchy, to really you know, extreme forms of structural inequality. Um, and um, we, we identify a couple of things. First of all, the, the answers lie on the small scale of human interaction. It's not about populations scaling up. It's about what goes on in families, what goes on in households. And we give a whole series of examples in the book from a whole different range of societies uh, about how inequality really begins from the bottom up. You know, you may have these, these big um, social movements and big political organizations, but ultimately they only really become stable and durable when people take them into their hearts and into their minds and internalize them in their gender relations and in, in the way that young people relate to old people and vice versa, domestic servitude, these kinds of things. And we also talk about violence and warfare. I've read some slightly, well, very misleading reviews of the book that claim that we romanticize the past. Not at all. We talk about prehistoric societies and indigenous societies that enslaved each other. Uh, that had uh, extreme forms of violence and warfare. Uh, we also talk about societies that did the opposite. Um, there's no romanticizing going on uh, there. Um, but what we try to understand is why sometimes that violence, even warfare, becomes structural. In other words, you know, you, you, you can have um, 
you can have violence, which is traumatic at the time, but it doesn't fundamentally alter the structure of society. Why is it that some forms of violence get into our homes? You know, they get into our, our, our entire mode of thought. And what we suggest in the book, in the, the various parts of the book, and more clearly in the conclusion, is that this happens when you get a kind of mixture, a confusion of violence and the opposite. Uh, of systems of violence and what we call systems of care, or even systems of love. Uh, if you, it sounds odd, but these are quite difficult questions to answer. So I'll give you an example. In uh, ancient Egypt, which is an area that I've done quite a lot of research on, um, on the one hand, very violent, uh, obviously very unequal society with Pharaoh at the top and, and, and the whole lot of peasants and all the rest of it. But actually, um, these famous monuments that we've all seen, the pyramids and pyramid temples, uh, those are actually the result of everybody at certain times of year coming to care for the king. Everyone gets involved in feeding the royal ancestors, building monuments for the royal ancestors. So you get this kind of conflation of violence and its opposite. Um, and we know this, I think, in our own societies. I mean, the love that people feel for their country can transform very easily into violence. And is it is it just that, like, uh, on some level, there is a a a societal advantage to violence in hierarchy that in terms of, I'm trying to think of this like evolutionarily. Um, well, the it, interesting thing about these systems of hierarchy is that they're not, um, in, I mean, once they exist, we also show examples of people dismantling. them, And I think that suggests that perhaps we are more on the right track here. Because if we're not talking anymore about great historical forces crashing around over people's heads and we're all just victims, you know, adapting to the environment or something, if we're talking about choices, then it should be possible for people to unravel those choices, which is actually what Rousseau felt. He wasn't really a fatalist. He just said it wasn't going to be easy. But if we go back to Egypt, there are periods when people stop building great royal monuments. They're called the intermediate periods, when the whole thing becomes a lot less centralized. We talk about the ancient city of Teotihuacan in central, uh, in the Valley of Mexico, where people start off with uh, ritual sacrifice and again, building great uh, pyramids and monuments and temples. Uh, and then they change it all around after a couple of centuries and put all of their resources into housing and, and putting everyone up in really fabulous apartments and you get a very nice living standard that would be the envy of any modern city. So these are relationships of hierarchy that uh, are very durable, are very powerful, but people have actually succeeded in walking away from them or reversing them. But do you think, do you think, and, 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 and uh, uh, that, that's, I mean, there's evidence, I mean, obviously, I mean, you're talking about it, but, but do you think that there is, that it requires more effort, I don't know how else to really sort of like explain it, like more effort because of certain elements of, of, I don't know if it's human nature or context, but more effort to, um, to dismantle or to veer away from those type yeah. of things than it does. I think it's, you know, this is an element of, um, I've, I've also seen people describe the book as anti-Marxist, but you know, if there's one insight I would take from Marx is that this is about self-consciousness. In the way that my late co-author David wrote about debt, you know, he, he had this point that the reason, the reason that, that, that debt um, not works, but you know the, the reason that, that people feel obliged to pay their debts is because they've internalized it as guilt. You know, um, they know at the end of the day that, that they're going to be forced to do it. That there's a, you know there's a stick, um, but it very rarely actually gets to that point because people feel guilty. They've internalized it as 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 their fault, their problem, something they have to you know not a system that was imposed on. Them. Although we know that's historically what happened higher education, for example, um, people feel it's their responsibility. And our argument about hierarchy is, is rather similar, not coincidentally, because I wrote it with David, but the logic is quite similar. 
So I think, um, you know, escaping it is partly a matter of becoming conscious of it, asking better questions about where it comes from, the, the micro relationships, how we produce domination every day. There was a French writer long before Rousseau called Etienne uh, uh, de la Boétie, who wrote a book on what he called voluntary servitude. It's about people who like domination, uh, who actually like not just to dominate others, but to be dominated, um, which, you know, in our minds probably conjures up, uh, uh, you know, dungeons and dominatrices and that kind of thing. But it's also part of our society. Uh, there's no getting away from it. Uh, we have to create these hierarchies somehow every day, but that's not how we usually think about it. We tend to think they're there because of thousands of years. If we think about it at all, we think, and if we pick up a book on it, we're told, no, the reason they're there is because of ancient Egypt. You know, it started thousands of years ago and because of the origins of farming and that sort of thing. So that's the kind of um, almost psychological damage or collateral damage of the conventional telling of history that we're challenging and that we're trying to to undo. Is it possible that that just all comes down to a certain amount of dumb luck, like uh, Rousseau and Hobbes were in the right time at the right place, and they were defending yeah. a certain uh, regime? I mean, I, I, like the only analogy I, within the context of our sort of more banal and, and recent politics is uh, when it came to, you know, we have a, a, a gerrymandering uh, problem in this country right now that is almost qualitatively uh, different because of the quantity of it. And it was just a function of Republicans won in a year where the technology was such for the first time mm. to go and just dumb luck on some level, maybe some uh, dumb level. But, you know, again, maybe we can learn something from Kandia Ronk and, and his folk who uh, were really intrigued by the fact that uh, Europeans European settlers could turn wealth into power. We just assume that's the case, that having more stuff than somebody else uh, gives you the right to boss them around, make them work for you, whatever it may be. It's the mystery of capitalism. In a way. It's what Karl Marx was trying to figure out. What is this magical process by which just having more stuff than somebody else gets transformed into power? Um, and this principle was actually quite alien to them. They weren't egalitarian in the sense that they shared everything out equally in some obsessive way, because it, it just didn't matter that much. It's not as if you could convert it into any sort of coercive power. So when we talk about corruption, um, you know, I think I'd, I'd, I'd hesitate to say that the technology is the driving factor here. There's a pre-existing nexus <clears throat> of relationships there uh, into which the technology you know, drops as a sort of slightly random factor. David Wengrau, uh, the book is The Dawn of Everything, A New History of Humanity, which you wrote with David Graeber. Thank you so much. Uh, fascinating. We will put a link to that at uh, majority.fm. Really appreciate your time today. Enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, folks. We're going to head into the uh, fun half. Uh, in just a moment, we're going to welcome uh, Nomi. Nomi will be coming. I will be right back. Uh, Emma will be right back. In the meantime, I will remind you, Majority Live. Come and see the show live. As of now, John Benjamin, H. John Benjamin, will be in attendance, as will Larry Murphy. I don't know what Larry's middle name is. Uh, you can get your tickets at MajorityLive.com. Uh, January 16th, the big live. Uh, also, it is your support that makes the show possible. You can become a member by going to jointhemajorityreport.com. When you do, you support the free show, you get extra content, and you keep us independent. Doesn't matter. Yeah, yesterday we celebrated uh, Mike Cernovich Day, and um, it was really actually a day late, but. Um, it was it was our members that basically um, gave us the the ability to address that whole situation and make sure that that he was not the one who was laughing now. Damn, um, Matt, what's happening in the Matt Leckian universe? Uh, yeah, tomorrow night, Left Reckoning returns with Paul Prescott. He is a, a Jacobin contributor, but also a Philly school teacher who's running for uh, Philadelphia's 
8th Senate District. Uh, we're going to have him on to talk about education, all the stuff that's uh, attacks on teachers and uh, his run for state office and uh, more. So patreon.com says left reckoning. That's tomorrow night at 8 Eastern, 7 Central. Know me. What's up? Happy Thanksgiving. Happy birthday. Happy all the things, Sam. Uh, and Sturdivich Day. Yeah. All these holidays in one weekend. How can I you know. handle it? It's pretty crazy. Well, uh, the Cernovich, um, the, the only reason why I remember uh, Cer um, Mike Cernovich Day is because it, it was it was supposed to be held on my birthday. Oh. Uh, that was the day he did it. I don't know if they ever, I always wondered this. If I ever had one question to ask uh, Mike Cernovich, it would be, did you realize it was my birthday that day? Like, I don't know if he did that on purpose. That would have been. If they, if they, they were being that thoughtful. Yeah, yeah, I mean that would have been yeah, not been nice. that, that would no, but that would have been smart to do. It would have been, yeah. Presumably, message, yeah. most people are out doing something on their birthday. He did not realize yeah. that on that day, all I was doing was basically the same thing I always do, which is like you know just having Chinese food. And, <laughs> uh, I was talking to ready for this. I was talking to John Benjamin, who happened to be there that night, and we 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 talked about it uh, when we had dinner for my birthday. This year, uh, which was um, like, yeah, I needed 20 minutes to, to write something up at the time. Blah, blah, blah. Nomi, um, you were busy last night. I was busy a few nights ago. We, we, oh. we pre-taped. Oh, you yeah. pre-taped. Right. Well, yeah, they don't do live. I, I think there's um, some shows are able to do live and some are not there yet, I think, for many reasons. But Okay, well, we are uh, we're going to play a couple of clips from your conversation with Dan DeBongadino. And Gino. And Gino. I almost called him that. I don't matter. Um, but in the meantime, what's happening on your show? Our show has a little bit more um, thought, I think, to it. But uh, tonight we have the one and only Harvey Kays on for his monthly stop by uh, on Rockfin and YouTube at 8 p.m. It's our TNS Live. So this is like a full, longer conversation where we delve in deep on a couple issues with our guests. And then um, tomorrow, Wednesday, we have Melanie DeRigo, who is was, I should say, uh, two years ago, she, she was a matriarch candidate and she ran, is a matriarch candidate, and she ran against Tom Swazi, who is one of the worst Democratic members of Congress, who has announced yesterday that he's running for governor. Uh, many think he's going to chip into Kathy Hochul, creating a whole other uh, scenario, but he is a congressman from uh, Long Island and parts of Queens, and she scared the crap out of him last run. And, you know, we don't know how the district's going to line up. Uh, redistricting, you know, probably won't be announced till the beginning of February, but uh, she is an extraordinary candidate and she like, it was just such a joy to work with and we're going to have her on tomorrow. So regardless, you know, you should support her if you can. So does Swazi think he's going to win or is he, is this, I mean, is he going to keep his, his seat in, in stepping line? down from his seat? That's it. It's an open seat now. What is he doing? Or is this just like an exit strat? Like, I don't understand. You know, sometimes the simplest answer is just called narcissism. All right. Well, I good. think that that's kind of what he's known for. He has a little, uh, a little bit of the strain of the, the, the political narcissistic tendencies. It's, it's a certain type of narcissism. There's, you know, there's, a, I think anybody who runs for office is a little bit full of themselves. Anybody who's in this media space has a little bit of, them, of that in them. And then there's, I mean, say, um, come on. Then there's, <laughs> then there's that like, like Cuomo, Trump, Swazi, I think is I, like on that spectrum. Yeah. But but I also I think in this instance it seems to me an overestimation of of his appeal. But I mean I guess who knows? I All mean right. people don't know he is now. But listen, you have a crowded field. Yep, I guess you raise I the money. All right. Well, with that said, we're going to take a quick break. Head into the fun half six four six two five seven thirty nine twenty. I'm not sure that we're going to. Um, I'm not sure that we're going to uh, take phone calls today. We'll see. But we will definitely take your IMs. You can get the app at majorityapp.com. See you in the fun half. Left is best. Jamie and I may have a disagreement. Yeah, you can't just say whatever you want about people just because you're rich. I have an absolute right to mock them on YouTube. He's up there buggy whipping like he's the boss. I am not your employer. You know, I'm tired of the negativity. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. 
you're nervous, you're a little bit uh, upset, you're riled up. Yeah, maybe you should rethink your defense of that, you fucking idiots. We're just going to get rid of you. All right. But dude. 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 Uh, you want to smoke this joint? Yes. <laughs> Do you feel like you are a dinosaur? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good shit. Exactly. I'm happy now. It's a win-win. It's a win-win-win. Oh, hell yeah. Now listen to me. Two, three, four, five times. Eight, four, seven, nine, oh, six, five, oh, one, four, five, seven, two, thirty-eight, fifty-six, twenty-seven, one half. Five eights, 3.9 billion. Wow. He's the ultimate math nerd. Don't you see? Why don't you get a real job instead of stealing vitriol and hatred, you left wing limbaugh? Everybody's taking their dumb juice today. Come on, Sammy. Dance, dance, dance. Grand Paul. I had my first post coital scene with uh, a woman. I'm hoping to add more moves to my repertoire. All I have is the dip and the swirl. Fine, we can double dip. Yes, this is a perfect moment. No. Wait, what? You make under a million dollars a year. You're scum. You're nothing. Excuse me? Fuck you, you fucking liberal elite. I think you belong in jail. Thank you for saying that, Sam. You're a horrible, despicable person. All right, going to take a quick break. I want to take a moment to talk to some of the libertarians out there. Take whatever vehicle you want. To drive to the library, <laughs> what you're talking about is jibber jab. Classic. I'm feeling more chill already. Good. Donald Trump can kiss all of our asses. Hey, Sam. Hey, Andy. Are you guys ready to uh, do some evil? Hitler was such an idiot. You think I might be a Nazi? Agree. No. Death to America. <laughs> you. Yes. Wow. Wow, that's weird. No way! Unbelievable. This guy's got a really good hook. Throw our hands up. <laughs> Ooh. Wow. Um, but Sam, I gotta get off. No worries. Ooh. Let's let's I wanna just flesh this out a little bit. I mean, look, it's a free speech issue. If you don't like me, hey, 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 shut up! Thank you for calling into the majority report. Sam will be with you shortly. We are back, ladies and gentlemen. It is the fun half of the program. Should we start with your your uh, Bangadino uh, thing, you John Dan the Vangina? The, this now this is the guy who what, is. Do I have this right? He went on. On, uh, he did an ad for himself where he's drinking his own urine. Did I get that right? Close enough. Yeah. I feel like uh, maybe, I'm not sure. He, he put a couple of lemons in a, uh, a blender and he then... a very strange uh, lemonade, uh, when life gives you lemons, at make liberal tears out of lemonade ad. Uh. That, that Vic Berger uh, did a more director's cut on. Oh, I see. We I covered it on the show one time. So it was covered. It was uh, Vic Berger did this uh, like metaphorical representation of, of I see. I see. Yeah, yeah I remember someone drinking. the subtext. Drinking... Yeah, I see. Right. I see what's going on here. All right. Well, uh, why don't you for, why don't you just tell us like how did uh, how did you end up um, having a debate or whatever it was with uh, Dan Bongadino? Uh, <laughs> sorry, I can't. Bongo. Oh, okay. It's Bongino, but it's van it's always it's always Vangina for me. Um, so they called me up. They called me up a few weeks ago. Actually, they've tried to have me on a few times, and this is his Fox show that he does Saturday nights at 10 p.m., but he pre-tapes it. Okay. And so he, um, which is, I think, for a lot of their shows, it's where they test them out before they put them into prime time on uh, regular, you know, the, the regular blocks. Um right. Prime time, but oh, I mean, I got to be honest. I like uh, he was uh, uh, when when originally in Politicon. I can't remember when this was. If this was like the year with the the Charlie Kirk, but they had um, suggested I debate him, and I was like, I've never heard of this dude. And and at the time, they were like, Yeah, no, he's he's sort of an up and comer or whatever it was. I feel and, like he's been an up and comer for but, uh, no, he's seven, like he's a huge audience, huge on Facebook mm. and this and that. Like okay. NRA pumped a lot of money into him, I think. and 
and uh, that was basically it. I mean, he rose where uh, Grant Stinchfield didn't, so credit to Bongino. Was Stinchfield at the they NRA, were NRA TV? TV partner? Where is Dana Loesch? We still don't know where she ended up. She's right. she did something recently. I don't I don't know what I she was. I think maybe she was on Megyn Kelly's show, which is a whole other weird turn. Um, like Megyn Kelly has gone Don Bongino right. It's you know they got to find their light. It's a business like it's a business business model for them. So if if one industry shifts, they have to shift over. But he, I will say, like I've been on with a lot of these hosts before, and um, I think he, a lot of them have difficulty getting people on the left on to debate, which I think is wrong. I think if you're going to take your position on the left, let me make that very clear for the audience. If you're going on to echo their talking points, don't go on. We know plenty of those folks. But if you're going on to actually have a debate, which is what they want because it helps them with ratings, they want the friction, um, then then do it. I mean, I, I there's certain shows I won't go on. I won't go on Hannity. I won't go on, uh, uh, what's that guy's name that used to be? Lou Dobbs because they change the topics midway through. They're not, you know, they don't play fair. I don't do um, Tommy, whatever her name is anymore, because she edits clips up and slices and dices, but that's not on Fox. She does that on her own. But he, I've, I think I've debated him once before. I thought he was very easy to debate. I think he is a lightweight. Um, Tucker is not an easy debate and you, you have to figure out a lot with a lot of these guys, it's just about like getting to know them and they get to know you. And then you start to get their vibe and, you know, you know, what pushes their buttons, what makes them laugh, you know, what breaks apart the conversation. And a big trick is tell a story. If you tell a story, it's the worst thing in the world to interrupt because people want to know the end. So there's all these sorts of, I'm, I'm giving away the trade secrets, but if you want to take on these guys, you know, there's, there's different ways of doing it. And I do say, go on, go on as much as you can get to know them, understand their psyche. But he was a lightweight. He was, uh, he let me talk. All right. Well, let's, let's go into, um, this first clip. You want to, which, which clip do you want to do? It's the same. It's just split in half. So I'm just a background. Um, I was initially supposed to be on the week before and they wanted me to come back on and talk about inflation. And I did it. It's very funny. They sent a van. This is a new thing they're doing. They sent a van that parked outside of my apartment. Uh, and it has a studio in the van. It's really cool. They do it for a lot of different cable networks now. I think it's a, it's a COVID thing, but it was, it was really neat. It was a van, but I had to do my own hair makeup, which you know, is the reason why you do this. I'm not going to lie. Okay. And so, uh, they, <laughs> that's my setup guys. There's a van and no hair and makeup. And I talked about inflation, the first clip, but I would say, let's start with the first one. Okay, let's play the, uh, this is the first clip, um, uh, Nomi on with uh, Dan Bonganino. So Nomiki, why is inflation the worst it's been in 30 years? And what's Joe Biden doing about it? And why isn't it working, whatever he is doing about it? I don't have to tell you or your viewers that these are unprecedented times. I mean, this pandemic, this, the longer this pandemic stretches out, the more unequal distribution of vaccines are dispersed globally. It's going to affect our supply chain. We rely on so many different goods from different parts of the world that do not have access to the vaccine, not to mention that there are still people in our country who refuse to take the vaccine. The longer the pandemic stretches, the more the economy is going to be affected. It is not the consumer's fault. You know, they have money in their pockets. They they want to spend it is the supply chain. Frankly, Larry Summers, one of those suits in Washington, is 100% false, and he has been in the past. They were wrong in 2008, and the way to shift that was, of course, to stimulate the economy, because if we didn't, Dan, we would have been into a long global recession. We have to get through this pandemic. People need to take the vaccines. We need to do this quickly so that we can all have access to the goods that we deserve to spend during the holidays, because it's been a very long two years, very long two years. Right. And it could have been done faster had President Trump taken this seriously. Instead, he and his cronies, his billionaire cronies, are making a lot of money off of disaster capitalism, you know, limiting supplies in, in an unfair way that hits your viewers, the people who are watching this right now. You know, they don't deserve to, right. to, to suffer the consequences no, of that I, I dispute that point strongly that President Trump didn't take it seriously. I mean, when he instituted a travel ban, they called him a racist only to see Biden do the same travel ban from African countries today. So I think that's kind of 
silly. But getting back to the inflation question, you didn't answer the question. Inflation's the worst it's been in 30 years. The growth rates on the yeah. on the economy under Joe Biden have gotten worse since he got in office. Since we, when President Trump was in office and we started to come out of the shutdowns, the economy was growing quite robustly. Those growth rates have slowed down, even though the economy's opened up more significantly. Those are just statistical facts. They're not open for dispute. Uh, the interpretation, you can interpret as you wish. So my point is this. If, if, how is it that inflation's the worst it's been in 30 years and economic productivity is the worst it's been in 40 years, even a decade longer? Okay. And so, um, so I'll look at math. I mean, is that the case with the uh, with GDP over the course of like uh, I guess we're still coming out of uh, the COVID or what? What's the deal? I think well, and you'll see in the second clip he tries to basically shift the blame, um, you know, obviously to 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 Biden, but they're they're using a lot of messy math. Like they're saying that more people have died. Um, from COVID under Biden than they did under Trump. That he said that and he said, it's indisputable, indisputable. And of course they have their little uh, figures that they cite from like rando websites that they all fund, these conservative sites. So, you know, there's like this, there used to be like selective citations. Now it's just like flat out propaganda bullshit. Um, and it's frustrating because- I think the numbers of deaths in 2020 in, in 2021, which is now, have now exceeded what they were in 2020, right? Not but, he was saying entirely, like, under Biden, there are more deaths than they were under Trump in America. I don't know if that's true or not. I think it's pretty close. I mean, I think there's going to end up being more deaths under Biden. But now cool. we, uh, but uh, I mean, I think- Trump had one year of the, the pandemic and Biden is going to have more. Yeah, well, the point he's selective, he he's selectively choosing those, you know, statistics. That um, exactly. But um, so there he is asking what inflation. I mean, the we should also say like the inflation's happening all around the world. Yeah. If there was a function of U.S. policy as opposed to just simply logistics and uh, COVID in in various places, then you wouldn't see it everywhere else in the world. It seems to me. Well, he was citing at the top, which was was cut out, that he cited Larry Summers and and who's been just a great, you know, a great advocate for uh, stimulus spending. And that was, you know, the, his whole preamble was, you know, we should have never spent all this money. The government should have never spent money putting into the pockets of people when this, you know, caused the inflation. I was like, no, 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 that's not what caused the inflation. If you didn't have this, you'd have a global recession. Pretty much every economist, except for Larry Summers and some quackadoodles, um, agree. And that, that was the premise of the argument, if you'd seen the first time. And then Donald J. Trump was on right before that, making a great case. So Junior or, or, or Junior Trump. Oh, OK. Gotcha. Junior. He just yelled for five minutes. Yeah. It, it also I'm looking at the GDP, you know, and I don't I, 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 I don't I haven't been following this, you know, uh, in the most case. But my understanding is I'm looking at this right now. It appears that GDP is higher in Q2 of 20 uh, of 2021 than it was. There was a dip in, uh, I think, probably. Well, I mean, but it it's higher in, uh, in Q3 than it's been ever. Two percent, right? Two percent. I, I just, I'm looking at the actual, maybe I'm actually just looking at the actual dollar figures. Um, and, then, and then they were, you know, the other thing that we didn't really have time to talk about, but inflation is actually pretty, it's it's only comparative to pre-pandemic, it is only, it's only up like by 0.2, or by 2%, that's it, 2%. So if you're really looking at it, inflation, yes, you know, inflation is up, we're having a supply chain issue. And on top of all that, you have companies who are now using this as an opportunity to limit their supply because they realize they can make a lot more money off of it. So it's like, you know, all of these things coming together, you know, the shippers, uh, uh, you know, goods, we know, we know, we know, but they don't know. So what I tried to do was I tried to make it about their viewers because they're the ones, you know, most of these viewers are upwardly mobile. They do have a little bit of extra cash in their pockets. And they're trying to purchase things for the holidays. And if they understand the connection between what's really causing this, I mean, people don't, what he's advocating is, is no government spending to put money into a stimulus, which is what their viewers want. So if their viewers are getting these checks or have gotten these checks, they want to spend it on something. And, and I mean, what I really should have said was, are you saying that 
your viewers don't deserve the checks that they got, you know, right. this last year? Are you saying that? You're right. saying that that's what's causing inflation? Um, let's play the second clip. Oh, let's... this got crazy. I don't like this part. <laughs> oh, let's watch it then. It's went cuckoo. I mean, isn't Joe Biden at fault or he just, you have, you have no problems with anything he's no. doing right now. I have a question for you. If you, uh, if you took out a credit card 10 years ago and then you put everything on that credit card, all of your bills in that credit card, and you had, you know, $50,000 in debt and the credit cards didn't come start coming after you until and 10 then... years later, does that mean that it just occurred overnight when you got that bill? Of course not. The economy okay, does not point happen taken. overnight. Wait, point Joe Biden I mean, I inherited time with an you. economy Wait. from... <laughs> okay, points. Uh, Nomiki, I will stipulate your point as long as you agree about the point you're making. So you're telling me government debt is a bad thing. I agree 100%. So should we accumulate more debt because you just acknowledge government debt's a bad thing? Should we accumulate more? I wasn't talking about government debt. I was actually talking about personal debt. The economy of the last two years is an effect of a prolonged pandemic in which, I'm sorry, Donald Trump didn't even want to take the vaccine. You know what's going to get us out of this? If everybody takes the vaccine, the vaccine and takes this seriously. He... Of course, why, a pandemic why, is why what is different you, in the last why 30 Why aren't years. you answering the question about it? All right, can, can I just get you on a record about that? It was, you made a, you kind of rebutted your own point in the rebuttal, which is the first time it's ever happened. You made a point trying to imply government <laughs> debt is bad and then went back to say, no, no, no it's, it's not personal. bad. It's good personal. when government spends. Well, what is it? Is debt bad when Donald Trump accumulates no, no, debt? No, no, but I, I, wasn't, Bernie I didn't Sanders mention. And, and Biden do? What is it? No, the economy, what I'm saying is all of the, all of the things that Donald Trump did over the last two years are now piling on. The fact that he did not want to spend money on, oh, on he did not want to take gosh. the vaccine Come seriously, on. the mask no, seriously, Mickey, this is hundreds silly. of thousands this is of people not... died because he didn't take it seriously, workforces were shut down, supply chain no, was shut Mickey. down, huge, oh, all they wanted to do was ban people. Hundreds of thousands more have died like, since Biden got in office. But hundreds of thousands more have died since Biden got in office. You just false. leave that all out. That That's amazing. And, and, so, and also, uh, I, and also, map yeah, that with the I, I people gotta, who will not take the vaccine or wear masks. It's it's right. it's not and, pseudoscience at this point. You yeah, want the, to, yeah, to masks, have your dollars yeah, buy you more That's products? Right. Take the masks. Yeah. Take the vaccines. Yeah. Wear the masks. No, Miki, I, I got to run. I'm Cause sorry. Effect, I just you kind of rebutted your own point there, but I appreciate it. Coming up on unfilled. Hmm. Yeah, that was a bit of a mess. I couldn't really quite follow. You guys just seem like on two different shows. That's called going on fox news welcome to fox well i mean the, i don't know the key is i don't i try not to get sucked down their rabbit holes and just go back to my own points because you're you've got valuable space there to say certain things and you know that's the trick you just don't respond to what they're trying to lead you down how is dan bongino so science? concerned about yeah. government debt was he that concerned with the tax cuts i don't think no. so but like, is you're not going to win that point with them. You're never going to win that point with them. So you just ignore it and you move to your points that you're trying to get to your audience. You'll never win those arguments with that audience. Right. Well, I mean, it looks like it was a lot of fun. At least you got it to go in the van. <laughs> I didn't get hair and makeup out of it, though. I mean, he, he, he that's the only comment he could make is, is that. And, and I didn't like, you know, the framing and I probably could have answered it better, but the, re the truth is, is just you go in with three points. You don't get out of those three points. Just keep repeating them over and over. Uh, Dan Bongino. There he is. Behind the um, um, Were there at least snacks in the van? No. But the guy running the van was progressive. And so I love when you're like sitting there and the, the, the people on set like disagree with Fox and they're like making faces and comments like, wow. There was also a weird delay that was a lot like it, you can't tell when you're watching it, but it was a very long delay. So it was hard to see or hear what was happening on the other end until it was a little bit late. That's interesting that uh, that that happens. It's a, it's annoying. Um, it's really annoying. Did you get a monitor or could you see him? No, no, no. You, you know, that happens like for you'll get a screen when you're on those individual sets, you'll usually have a monitor where you can see the person. But this one was, I was just staring into the abyss and hoping, <laughs> like, <laughs> hoping it worked out. Well, I mean, just for the, the viewers who might be watching this, if someone comes up to you in a van and says they're with Fox News, get in and say, get in the Fox News van, you, you should not do that, right? Agreed. <laughs> so, um, Even if they're snacks. <laughs> 
early in Nomi, you uh, we were w- wondering what happened to Dana Loesch, uh, and I have an answer to this question. Uh, she's currently a children's book author. She has a book here called Pause Off My Cannon. Stop it. Uh, a hungry Ahina sprang onto the riverbank waving a coconut cannon. Bon- Bonko's best friend Bonnie squealed, the hyenas are here for our cupcake dinners. The hyena quick as a flash grabbed her picnic basket full of sweets. Now I'll just read a little bit of the... What? Of the... Uh, in book six of Saga One, Brave Books and Dana Loesch have joined forces to discuss the importance of the Second Amendment through the story, Pause Off My Cannon. Mm. This story follows Bongo, a daring and hungry gorilla who loves eating food, especially mushroom-shaped cupcakes. Uh, but one day, a villainous... <laughs> Wait a second, can we just stop on the title, Pause Off My Cannon? Wasn't that like, I, I feel like I went into a place on 42nd Street about 25 years ago, and that was one of the lead titles. <laughs> it's a little deep there deep cut i don't know if people are gonna get that one um this story involves bongo a daring and hungry gorilla who loves to eat food um especially mushroom shaped cupcakes but one day a villainous hyena aren't all mu- cupcakes mushroom shaped yeah yeah I mean, that's a good point um but one day a villainous hyena shoots a coconut at bongo and his friend bonnie Bonnie is so upset at this misuse of coconut cannons that she suggests the village ban all coconut cannons. Bongo thinks that the hyenas are the problem, not the coconut cannons. Are you kidding me? Bongino? No, no. <laughs> the only thing that will stop a hyena with a uh, with a coconut cannon is a good hyena but with so a coconut Instead of like you know, a cat coconut cannon control, we're just going to exterminate all the hyenas, I guess. The debate splits Mushroom Village, and when the hyenas come back, their views are put to the test. Will Bongo and Bonnie finally see eye to eye, or will one side prevail? That's a good little story for your kids. Jesus. And is... Lord, where's, the part, where's the part where the hyenas are, or the, the, the uh, what is it? The, what's the other animal? A gorilla? The gorillas, yeah. The hyenas yeah. are culturally deficient. Where's the part where the gorilla has to teach the baby gorillas to protect themselves in their classrooms from the crazy hyenas who storm in with their their cannons and bongos or whatever the they're throwing? Where's that part? <laughs> what well, is just book six is Saga One, so. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> subscription. It's amazing how, like, I mean, most like parents just want to read the giving tree to their kids or whatever, and conservatives are like, they're, uh, the left is indoctrinating our children, and yet they actively write stuff like this. But it's also like, man, you, you couldn't have come up with something that's a little bit less sort of like a, 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 obtuse? I mean, that is it's really... too convoluted, right? The canon, like the... <laughs> The like the coconut cannon is supposed to be like, well, well, here's the thing that I don't understand. If if there's no problem with guns, why don't you just say that the that they got a gun? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, what if Bonnie was shot at with like a 243? Yeah, exactly. I thought the whole point was don't be afraid to give your kids a gun for Christmas this year. Well, why, why, why can't you just say the the gorilla had a gun? I know your kids are going to go to like a sports game and see a t-shirt cannon and be like, I, I like have a I right could, to own that. Yeah, I feel like I could write, I, I feel like I could write this better. I mean, the gorilla has a gun because there are poachers. The bad guys where the guns are coming, so you give the there gorillas the guns and they fire back at the poachers. Yeah, but, the, but that's then the Trump sons, and then that confuses everybody because uh, poachers. But they, she has to answer to Wayne LaPierre, or maybe not anymore, right? But LaPierre loves, would probably love hunting. I'll a just to read that with guns uh, substituted. But one day, a villainous hyena shoots a gun at Bongo and his friend Bonnie. Bonnie is so upset at this muse <laughs> of a gun that. She- Yes, the village banned all guns. Bongo thinks that the hyenas are a problem, so not the guns. So it does sound, it doesn't sound quite as good. Coconut cannons sound a little bit... Yeah, coconut oh, cannons. Coconut, 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 coconut cannons. It's also sort of like, wait a second, what? <laughs> what why do you have a coconut cannon? That, yeah, the right that sounds to coconut like a drink that I'd love. Yeah. What also makes it, like, like supposedly like this is supposed to be a, um, you know, uh, like a... Like, uh, the coconut cannon is supposed to be like a way of like softening the, the idea of a gun, but... Uh, you sh- fire a coconut cannon at me. I'm also gonna die. <laughs> I, uh, maybe. I mean, that's depends on the velocity of the cannon. It's a coconut cannon, and the coconut explodes into shrapnel and uh... <laughs> tasty shrapnel. Very tasty, though. We want to make it uh, suitable for kids, so the coconut cannon will goes into shrapnel as opposed to like a like a bullet. 
Yeah. So instead of just one metal thing exploding your organs apart, it's little sharp pieces of coconut. Yeah, but I like how they it just real scratches you. <laughs> the real message the kids are supposed to learn is it's not this uh, you know um, uh, tool of war that's bad. It's these entire species of other uh, right. creatures. Right. The problem is the hyena, oh, yes. not the coconut cannon. Is it clear why they have coconut cannons? Like they what? stole them from another village, probably. But my After point they is, murdered them. Why does the gorilla need a coconut cannon? No, he doesn't. It's the it's the hyenas who have the coconut cannons. No, who's who's the bad one? They all do. Everyone's, they, they all have coconut cannons, but the have... people who miss oh, right. are the hyenas. But I want to know what the use of the coconut cannon. Oh, is. I mean, there's a, there's a coconut cannons are how we protect ourselves. Bongo rubbed his head. We should keep cannons close in case the hyenas come back. But uh, haven't we decided to eliminate all hyenas? Uh, uh, let's see. Well, I mean, with the coconut cannons. I mean, how are you going to eliminate the hyenas if you don't have coconut cannons? That's Co the third book. <laughs> Hyena. Drafe the entire area yeah. with coconuts Just where genocide. the hyenas are. That's Hyena genocide, yeah. And so that night, the picnic continued. Bongo and the other villagers sat around the rocket uh, river eating delicious mushroom-shaped cupcakes. She loves that. There's cupcakes. too much descriptor. Too With many loads... descriptors. Well, yeah, no, that's a kid's book thing, I think. With loads of purple and yellow and orange icing. Uh, they ate in peace because they knew Bongo would protect them with his coconut cannons. Bongo loved food, but most of all, Bongo loved his village. You know, oh you know, God. to me, the bongo could probably just deal with hyenas anyways. He doesn't need a coconut cannon. And can he catch coconuts? Doesn't he? I, I don't know. I mean, it's all in the book, Sam. I get it. Wait, who published this? Uh, Brave Books. This is Brave Books in partnership with Dana Loesch. Um, That's a, is that a conservative publishing? Gosh, it sounds I mean, like Brave it. Books. We right. Right. Brave books. Freedom. Like Josh, Josh from Tucson, coconut cannon is my new tiki drink. I, honestly, well, that's I what like, I said. It sounds like you know, if I'm going on vacation, I want a coconut cannon. That, that it, it does feel like, oh god, man. <laughs> Square. I got, I got too, too many, many coconut, coconut cannons. cannons, right? But I got, I kept the, uh, I kept the straw and the umbrella. That's not sound. Yeah, I've so. put the umbrella in your hair. That's an old trick. Flair child. Got a Nielsen rating poll letter with $2 cash. I submitted that I watched the majority report with Sam Cedar. Not sure what statistical significance oh, wow. that'll make, but they're supposed to send me $5 more. I can't believe they spend $7 per, but I'll take it. Props to the post office for Noor losing a letter with cash visibly shown. I don't know what Noor means. Wait, so the Nielsen is for Peacock from when you were on Peacock or from here? Is Nielsen counting? I think they, I count, no I think they count digital consumption now. I have no idea. They oh, look at that. Between the 101 and the 5, hey, Sam, can I get a shofar for my uncle who passed away this weekend? He was a Vietnam vet, had dementia and Parkinson's. Unfortunately, there was a COVID outbreak at the VA hospital he was at. Going to miss him a lot. I'm really upset about the way they've handled COVID. People should not be dying almost two years out. He had other health problems and was older, but was vaccinated and boosted. Wear high-quality masks, and please get your third dose, people. We need to release the patents. Love you guys. The show helps so many. I'm so sorry. Uh, sorry to hear that. This is for your uncle. Uh, fierce deity. There are, in fact, three levels to the Wilbur, including the floor, which is mostly tables, about 1,000 seats total. So there you go, folks. Get on it. Rabbit from Boston. R.I.P. David Graeber. Debt changed the way I saw the history and the word world. Also, put this interview in the goat category. See, this is the problem when we do like a yeah. potential best of in December. The end of November. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I guess we could run it again, theoretically, right? I mean, just put could, it on the I list think, and we can decide. Uh, we can we'll decide. look at, we're going to look at last year's uh, November, December. Once yes, too. we do that. That's the way, that's the other thing we do. Oh, Shobi. Has Emma seen the Q&A with Patrick Rothfuss, author of, of Name of the Wind, where he's asked who had heard him in the past to make Denna? It's both insightful and hilarious. I haven't seen it, no. But I mean, I, I, what? I, I just, I mentioned this the book series I like on the on yeah. the show, and uh, I haven't watched any of his Q and A stuff, but I, I should. Gorka's robocaller, Sam. How much did you practice to be able to say Omicron correctly? Omicron. Oh, I can't believe you didn't call me. I speak fluent Greek. Come on. I, I've been saying Omicron. it. Omicron. 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 Oh, that was beautiful. 
Thank you. Now say my name. Omicron. Omicron. <laughs> oh my God, please put this on the loop. I want to listen to this over and over. Um, let's see. Sound Come shower somewhere. with Crowder. Glenn just released an hour and a half video that was a response to you in particular, named you, and liberals in general saying that he has had a rightward shift. The odd thing about it was that he had it on a very small YouTuber who really couldn't represent a solid critique against him, even though he did seem sincere. The only thing that I learned is that Tucker doesn't articulate racist views on his show, but rather his anti-immigration opinions are about protecting blue collar worker wages. I mean, okay. yeah, I mean, I don't know what to tell you. Um, that's great. I hope it does well on Rumble. <laughs> uh, that's not, but if you're here because you watched uh, Glenn's uh, video on Rumble and want to call in, 646-257-3920 is the number. I don't think we got the phones up right now. We got to turn off the voicemail. Um, we don't have the phones on at the moment, but we'll, on Tuesdays is, is rough because we're all here, but maybe, but tomorrow, I promise. Um, has anyone on staff watched Yellowstone? Some of the ways your guest outlined Native Americans were historically used as sock puppets for capitalist critique make me wonder how to feel about that show as much as I enjoy it. Perhaps I could write in again on your TV talk Thursday. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I don't watch Yellowstone, but I feel like everybody over the age of 50, sorry, Sam, in my life is obsessed with it. I, I was just going to say, I went home and everybody is watching Yellowstone. Yes. <laughs> it's, I, I don't know that I heard of it before I went home. Yeah. yeah. My boyfriend. Wait, wait, where is it? Everybody's obsessed with Yellowstone. Never heard. It's a Netflix show, I think. Yeah. Oh. I thought it was Paramount. It's set in, oh, is it? It's set in like modern Montana with like land disputes. And Costner, like... Kevin Costner. Cost. Oh, but I'm sold. That's not oh. fraud. Uh, the dumb dumb left used to defend Jimmy Dore's Tucker Carlson appearances using Nomiki's work on Fox News as a false equivalent, insulting all of our intelligence. Kudos to Nomiki for head on confronting the BS. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, Jimmy Dore goes on Fox News to tell things they they never hear, like don't vote for Democrats. And <laughs> right. Democrats are hypocrites. Right. <laughs> Judy. Um, the far right candidate for the Chilean presidential runoff election cast is here in the States today to meet with Marco Rubio. He's Public down by like how many votes right now? What was the latest? He's down by like at least a dozen. Not votes, uh, percent. <laughs> wow. Uh, J Man Raps, looking forward to the stupid discourses by the mainstream media on Russia again as tensions heat up between Russia and Ukraine. By the way, Nomiki has the best show, No Cap. What do you think? No. no. Cap. That means, yeah. What do you like think? Center for American Progress. Thank you, by the way, but I don't know what that means. Uh, it sort of means uh, uh, cap means line. Yeah. yeah. So no. Oh no line. Yeah. But, oh uh, no line. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering if she knows how big seamlessly. the Greek freak is in Greece. Huge, 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 and he's. I mean, even though there's like a lot of racism, uh, and and that goes with nationalism, I think he breaks their brains because he makes everybody so proud. Um. That makes sense. Yeah, it's a confusing thing. Impossible to dislike, so. Kid tested, Paula Bureau approved, fascinating and fantastic interview, still waiting on Sam's children's book, Perry Platypus and the 12 year campaign to institute postal banking. <laughs> <laughs> we should figure out how to market those. No kidding. That was good. I like that. Perry, Perry Platypus and <laughs> postal banking. <laughs> Brilliant. I like that idea. And the tort tortoise. <laughs> the tort tortoise. <laughs> I think we're on to something here. I mean, if Dana Loesch can do it, we're on a soy boy books. And we can get the like leather that. hack. <laughs> we could get the leather hack to do all the, the cartoons. That's beautiful. Right? Oh, that's an idea, actually. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you hear a lot of critique of uh, of Fauci. I think there's uh, probably some uh, legitimate critiques around a Anthony Fauci. I think, um, like I say, public health policy, very uh, uh, difficult to navigate, particularly in a country where there is a um, an ongoing, and I imagine there's some of this in, in every country, but there is an ongoing 
uh, I want to call it cottage industry, but it's almost like a full on corporate industry of COVID denial that has, um, that has, you know, uh, morphed into, uh, uh, vaccine denial into all sorts of different types of, of denials. But, um, this is an interesting, um, take from Lara Logan, who is, um, I think people are quickly realizing has completely lost all of her marbles on uh, Fox News. And so in that moment, what you see on Dr. Fauci, this is what people say to me, that he doesn't represent science to them. He represents Joseph Mengele, Dr. Joseph Mengele, uh, the, doc, the Nazi doctor what? who did experiments on Jews during the Second World War and in the concentration camps. And I am talking about people all across the world are saying this because the response from COVID, what it has done to countries everywhere, what it has done to civil liberties, the suicide rates, the poverty, it has obliterated economies, the level of suffering that has been created because of this disease is now being seen in the cold light of day, i.e. the truth. And people see that there's no justification for what is being done. I, is, so is she blaming uh, Fauci for the lockdowns in other countries? Is that it? Yes. Yeah, pretty much. They, they, take the, they take the lead from us because we're in charge and he's really running the country. Don't you know that? I mean, wasn't the first lockdown in China where they literally locked down entire multi-million people cities? I don't think you're getting it. I think, you know, you're not really w awoken to the uh, global ring of pedophiles being run by Fauci and uh, other deep state elites. I mean, that's what she... I, the, that's the implicit, like everything is connected with conservatives now. It's all it was Biden's long term plan, and Anthony Fauci was controlling the puppet strings. And um, they did it from, you know, the Lolita Express 20 years ago. They were planning this out. Could you put the, put, put the image back up there in the middle of when she's talking? Because I'm, I'm really curious about this. Um, Lara Logan is claiming that there are people around the world that she talks to, which I, I, I tend not to doubt any of it. Keep going, because I want the split screen. I want to see, yeah, yeah, this, okay? Stop for a second. Uh, Laura Logan at this point is saying that there are people that she talks to on a regular basis who are saying that Anthony Fauci is like Joseph Mengele, who would experiment on, on Jews in concentration camps. And I wonder what is going through the minds of Pete Hegseth, and Will Kane in particular. I mean, head sick, I think, is a, a lunatic. But Will Kane, you know, at one point was a uh, a normal human being, um, and uh, you know, this guy who lives on the Upper West Side sends his kid to private school. You know, like is, uh, goes around with like you know, I think you know, in the, the some type of social elite in in, in New York City. I wonder, like, if he's thinking in his head, like, I cannot believe. I'm having to do this for money. Sit here and listen to Lara Logan say that Anthony Fauci is like Joseph Mengele. I wonder if, like what is going through that guy's brain. Like, God, I hope I don't have to drop my kid off at private school tomorrow and run into anybody who even remotely like not a lunatic. Because I have no doubt that Laura Logan is talking to people on a regular basis who are saying that Anthony Fauci is like uh, Joseph Mengele. Probably even worse than that. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. also think that they're lunatics. But, okay, so he has gone that far. I Like, just a, I, five months ago or six months ago I was on, we talked about this. He was just as, I mean, just as loopy as she is. They're all, what I don't understand about this, though, is the audience that they're talking to the majority of them, the majority in reality, have taken the vaccine. So how is it that they are spewing, they're going so far right, and it is, of course, influencing that perfect number of people who don't want to take the vaccine still and who are in denial. Why is it that they are completely shifting their entire coverage to accommodate this insane Trump base because they are afraid of losing it to Newsmax and, and OAN or whatever it is, when the majority of their audience, you know, family members of mine included, who watch Fox News are vaccinated, believe in, in who are anti-Trump, by the way, and believe in in uh, the pandemic. I don't, I don't get it. I, I think there is a quality of like, we have got to let them talk about their, the, the, this is, if you step back and don't look at the content, but you think about the modality of thought that's going on here, we have to give credence 
to completely baseless, non-scientific hyperbole. Because I get to exercise that in other areas if, if we get to allow the anti-vaxxers to do this. I think that is what goes on in the mind of a, of a Fox viewer who oh, has oh, been vaccinated. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, because they probably have opinions that when they try to articulate them around other people, get shot down and they don't want to feel. So they're going to allow a certain amount of license for those type of opinions. And by doing so, it gives them license to express other things, maybe about like well, what women's role should be in society or what other people in society are doing and aren't deserving of. I mean, I, that's my theory as to why it's okay. Nobody who's vaccinated goes like, eh, I can't watch this anymore because uh, Laura Logan is completely out of her mind. It's more like, eh, okay, it's like I made the personal choice to get the vaccine, but this is government right. overreach now. And this is much like all these other things you're seeing with Biden. Fauci could be a Mengele or he could be not. We just, you know, who's to say? And you know that the Biden administration is super cozy with China and who's really pulling the strings, strings behind the, uh, the scenes is is Fauci. And then he that's why he's probably working with the people in Wuhan who created the pandemic and then it's all created. He's a consigliere. That's how we used to call it. The consigliere between the two. No, I mean, I don't know. I don't, I, I think that the amount of energy they're putting on this, it's still, I, I don't get it. It's not a small part of the programming. It is a dominant part of the programming now. It is like full on conspiratorial, like it is, it is totally like the dark, the dark, you know, it's not the dark web. It's, 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 it's conspiracy zone. And I don't know. I don't think it, it matches up with their actual audience. I don't know. Uh, I would suggest that maybe uh, Representative Nancy Mace from uh, South Carolina disagrees with you. Here we have her uh, spending her Sunday, right? This was on Sunday. She did the uh, did the rounds. And uh, let's first, uh, are these two connected? Okay, we're going to, uh, the first clip is going to be, she's on Fox News. The second clip, she's on CNN. And folks, you really got to know your audience. And she apparently does. Uh, in some studies that I've read, natural immunity gives you 27 times more protection against future COVID infection than a vaccination. And so we need to take all of the science into account and not selectively choosing what science to follow when we are making policy decisions. Uh, and and I, I've been a proponent of vaccinations and, and wearing masks when we need to. And we had the Delta variant raging in South Carolina. I wrote an op-ed to my community and I've worked with our State Department of Health. I've run ads encouraging uh, my district to go and get vaccinated. And when we have these variants and we have these spikes to take every precaution from washing our hands to wearing the N95 or KN95 masks uh, more than the medical masks, there is a significant, statistically significant a uh, number of people that are protected from COVID when they wear those masks. And I just, re I just returned from the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, I Busy Sunday for her. Busy Sunday. She had to go on Fox News, <laughs> then get, you know, her, I, that brain transplant. And that's I, I honestly wonder if, like, she needs to have, like, her, her staffers hold up a sign in front of her going, like, you're on CNN, you're on Fox. Yeah. That's impressive. I mean... She's running, right? She's running. Whatever it is that she's she's running. And um, that, just remember her, remember those two clips, folks, because that's the way you do it. That's, the, that's the way the real pros do She didn't it. even change her shirt for those. She's wearing the same outfit, same outfit making the rounds. Yeah, and that's why it's a, it's a small point, but it, that's why it should be a right to um, for us to play clips like this, because to show the different, so that those channels can't lock them in and basically cover for people doing stuff like that, being able to point out that th this is the way people are being lied to, I yeah. think is really important. That's, I mean, it is just amazing. And she will not be held to account by either... Uh, cohort of people she was talking to you know what i mean like the the anti-vaxxers are going to be like well as long as she's getting the message out she's got to have to toe the line which goes on to you know cnn uh and the cnn people will be like well we're glad to have her i mean she's showing some responsibility yeah 
but that's, what, that's why i mean cnn having someone like her on is just that you, you can't defend that kind of stuff no. because you're giving you're literally just gifting her credibility in a bow for you, your audience you can't act like her previous public statements don't exist you have to right. be aware of those as Absolutely. a broadcaster and they are though that's they are pro- yeah. you have to, but like there that should be the responsibility to uh interrogate that contradiction and of course you know they uh, well and they, I mean, they are aware, like you look at those green rooms, they've got all the different shows on screen. I mean, th- that's kind of how you become like a frequent, you go on one show and you, you, you do well. And then the other, you know, the competing show on the other network wants you. And they're very aware. They're fully aware of how batshit she was on the other network. And you're right. I mean, they should have an obligation. Have you guys talked about Cuomo yet? Speaking no, of? No, actually. No, let's do. I mean, um, I did that. Um, on the day, I can't remember what day it was, but I did that, uh, uh, what was that guy? Michael Cohen's show. I went on the, uh, don't ask me why. They asked Wait, me Michael to, Cohen, like the lawyer? Yeah. He's got a uh, pod, show? podcast. And uh, they had asked a bunch of time, and I was like, fine, I'll go on that thing. I don't care. Uh, because there was actually some questions I, I had of him that maybe someday, you know, that he allowed me to ask him that maybe someday we'll talk about. Uh, Wait, it, when, when was this? Was this when he was locked down, like in his self? I, I think it was maybe, I don't know, three or four months ago. I can't remember. Oh, wow. And um, I, I'll, I'll explain. You and Kanye. At a later date as to, as to why uh, I had some questions for him that, that he answered that I just wanted to get on the record. But that's that's neither here nor there for for the time being. But I do remember him like bringing up uh, Andrew uh, Chris Cuomo. I was like, this guy needs to be fired. I mean, even with the uh, what we knew about his involvement before, just the fact that like, why would you have him ever bring his brother on TV, even if it's just to like say like, hey, it's just two brothers. Like I could see doing it once for like the Thanksgiving, you know, like a Thanksgiving special. I bring my brother on, but you know, we never have him on because of course he's my brother and he is the governor of the state and I'm supposedly a news guy and it even might be a I, conflict of interest. Even Just if might I, be. <laughs> you guys think that's a thing. Even if we fully reveal that we're brothers, it's just somebody else should come on and interview him, whatever well, it is. Then you'd have to like get rid of Morning Joe, and then you'd have to get rid of like lots of other shows with the guy with the, the John Avalon and Margaret Hoover. You know, it would just affect the industry too much if, if you had a conflicts of interest clause. Uh, are they? Wait, why? Why is that? Oh, they're married. Oh, okay. But they're not, one's not a politician, not interviewing each other. No, 100%. But, you know, once you get into that zone, it's just to open up. I don't think so. I don't, it's fine. You want to have a married couple on, on set? That's fine. But the point is, you can't have a politician being interviewed by their brother on a regular basis. You couldn't have, you know, say, Scarborough ran again, Mika interviewing him and like <laughs> giggling, like, oh! <laughs> Right, no, of you know what the show's called? Right. You're so great with the guitar. Tell us again why you're voting for this. I mean, it, you know. And Has so, anyone ever told you that you're the next Springsteen? Now, even, <laughs> even if it was not revealed that Chris Cuomo has lied about his role in coaching his brother, wanting to help his brother, wanting to provide defense for his brother, even if none of that was revealed and we didn't know that he had lied to uh, the public. And who knows? Maybe he lied to CNN. Maybe he didn't. This guy's got to go. He's got mm-hmm. credibility whatsoever. CNN has an attempt to have any credibility whatsoever. They've got to fire him. I mean, either they knew or they didn't know. Either way, he's gone. And if they knew, even worse, he should tell. I mean, I, I, like, there's no other question. I don't care about that guy uh, one way or another. And he sucks. Give me a break. I mean, it's. Uh, I mean, it's. It's. It's astonishing that they allowed him to ever, ever interview his uh, brother on TV. Well, it was great ratings. I mean, that's ultimately like what it comes down to. It's great ratings, and there's that that circle of folks who cycle through the contributors who've worked for Cuomo. Many, many, many are his advisors and consultants. The same. There's like that overlap with the Clinton. The Clinton and Cuomo's have like a lot of overlap in terms of their little inner circles. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a legacy. I think of the Clinton era. I, I really believe like that's what's at stake here. You know, Cuomo's Cuomo's democratic party in New York state, for instance, just to show you how like much their teeth still exist in this universe. And it really has to be cleansed out. Um, 
Cuomo's Democratic Party, he appointed pretty much, well, more or less, it's, it's, it's his people, with exception to a few that have been able to, like, stage a coup. But it's his Democratic Party, Jay Jacobs, everybody was his choice. And they make up the majority of the membership of the DNC, okay? So the DNC right now was set up so that Cuomo could run for president someday. And it's still operating like that. And then yeah. you've got these same people as contributors, official contributors on CNN and on the board of like News Corps. And I mean, these, they're, they're, it is an ecosystem and it needs to be cleansed out. There were, con- there are no conflicts of interest in the DNC. There's you know, no conflicts of interest rule at CNN. And that's how the right operates. Well, we should just make clear what these allegations were with Chris Cuomo, because yeah. I don't even think we really said. No. Uh, basically, Cuomo or Chris Cuomo, during the investigation uh, into sexual harassment into his brother, um, basically said that he was not involved. Um, and then information started trickling out that he was involved in meetings, but he said that he was not an official um, advisor, uh, kind of very specific language on that front. And now even his initial claims are contradicted because the, uh, investigation by the attorney general's office into andrew cuomo has basically found these correspondences um that that show chris cuomo talking with melissa de rosa um him who is who is, who is uh, the governor's like uh one of his top eight right hand secretary person, right yeah one of the, the quotes that's making the rounds is i have a lead on the wedding girl uh aka the woman who accused Andrew Cuomo of attempting to kiss her without her consent at a wedding. So basically, Chris Cuomo was using his powers as an investigative journalist, seemingly, to investigate the women that were making uh, allegations against his brother, and then publicly claiming that he had no involvement in the um, in the investigation and in advising his brother. No official involvement, and that's you know, don't forget this is not. These are also lawyers. Both of them are lawyers. They're very aware of their language. They are very aware where the limits of the law are. And they've, you know, repeatedly through 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 basically setting up power structures that prevent them from being held accountable, you know, because of that and because of the incentive structure of ratings and and having a governor and a and a and a host in line with each other during it's they've been able to get away with this. But yep. he says it wasn't official, meaning he didn't get paid. Yeah, no shit. Like, what the F does that even mean? It wasn't a They didn't have a contract. Come on. I mean, he's paying it forward, basically, because the entire reason that he's even in the multi-million dollar position that he's in at CNN is because of his brother and because of his father. So he didn't get officially paid, but, you know, it's like a secondary payment, essentially. Is that the rule uh, at CNN? You can't be a paid advisor. Well, no, because what happened with Donna Brazil was she wasn't a paid of it. That was the whole like out for her was she said she and she did, to be fair, she did offer the same information to Tad Devine on Bernie's campaign. That was like the crazy part of that whole uh, when she had to step down, she gave that insider information unpaid to the Clinton campaign, but also to Tad Devine from the Bernie campaign. But she had to step down because it was a conflict. And she was on. She was not officially a paid advisor to either one of the campaigns. So you know, if that rule works for Donna Brazil, who's very safe in her position at ABC now on this week with George Stephanopoulos now, um, Fox. No, I think she's there too. You can do dual. No, she blocked me in 2016. So. <laughs> <laughs> Boop. Boop. <laughs> what she's been up to. Um. Well, there it is. Uh, Chris Cuomo. I. I, I mean. <laughs> God, let's is... do a countdown for him. You think he's gone? He's got to be, right? He's got to be. I don't know how they keep him. He's on. really a favorite of the exact audience they're coveting, though. So I honestly, I think the odds are less than what you got. They'll still. I mean, his ratings. I think what is he? He's the highest viewed right now, but they're all in flux all the time. He's up against Anderson Cooper and Don Lemon. Please, in terms of like the editorial content that the this like current suburban Trump hating like centrist audience is craving they're gonna yeah they they like what cuomo's putting out there i think don't worry tom swazi has a place to go if you need another italian the chair of the cuomo columbus day parade tom swazi can fill in in the meantime for a little long island love all right which one of these uh tucker carlson uh bits should we play here do you want to play the ennis cancer thing the what though that might not be on your sound sheet 
can't uh, the basketball player and his oh i messed up on this one big time what happened i didn't know he was fascist and i was i watched it and i was like or he was like aligning with the fascists i just saw like a sliver of what this guy was up to and i don't follow sports so i got dragged on the internet by our folks and i deleted it and i apologize and okay all right well here is uh celtic center and he's a backup right well, I, yeah, now, right? He's not in the rotation, really. Not, nah, but but he played for the Knicks for a while. Um, known to have like a pretty out there personality, boisterous. Um, doesn't play defense, but at a certain point, he was a good rebounder and a good scorer. Uh, and now he's a little bit past it, and can't his uh, problems on defense are too glaring, and his offense isn't where it used to be. But and he, but he spoke out against Erdogan in a very aggressive way, and that was he's years Turkish. Ago. He he's was Turkish. 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 So well, that's why I thought he was cool. National level. U.S. citizen. His father, I believe, is still in prison in retaliation for Cantor speaking out about Erdogan. So there was a lot of rightful praise of Ennis Cantor's um, bravery and the fact that he was choosing to speak out about a lot of the things that Erdogan is doing, which as on the left, of course, we don't agree with. But like now it seems he's basically just a CIA asset. <laughs> well, and, and, and but he's also, you know, unlike our uh, our our you know, anti-imperialist uh, uh, left. He recognizes the genocide uh, of the Uyghurs. He has challenged Nike and said that Nike uh, commits human rights abuses. And so I think all three of these things, which is what, what I saw, are praiseable things. You know, recognizing human rights abuses on your land, other lands, it's human rights abuse, human rights abuse. Problem is, is he's like cozied up to Kushner and, and, uh, and John Bolton, and not just to lobby them, because that's what I wanted to clarify when people came to me. They said, oh, he cozied up, cozied up to, to Bolton. I said, well, was he lobbying him in the government? There's, you know, that was the government at the time. But turns out, no, 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 they're all pals. Yeah, no, no, there's he's, a, he's in this new crowd now. There's yeah. a Mint Press News article. Uh, Celtics are CIA Google. <laughs> Enos Cantor rides both benches. While there's no evidence that Enos Cantor is a CIA employee, then 29 uh, does have many great troubling relationships. So if you want the uh, skinny, I think Mint Press. I, I'm not job. saying... Uh, I don't. Uh, Mid Press also called me a CIA agent, so let's take that with a grain of salt. No. Well, that's true, but this is just outlining. Do we know did that you're not? Did you Bruce change your last name to Freedom and then say this on Tucker Carl? I mean, my name does mean law, so watch out, guys. This is not Ennis Cantor. This is Ennis Cantor Freedom. 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 I mean, come on, man. I know. Again, probably CIA asset. I don't know. I don't know. To be here as you clearly are. <laughs> Um, how have your teammates responded? Do you think they're as grateful to be Americans as you are? Oh, God. I mean, my teammates actually, you know, were really, really happy for me because they knew the struggle that I had the last, you know, six years. Uh, you know, it was a funny joke in the beginning because they were calling me Mr. Freedom and now it became a reality. <laughs> but uh, I think my teammates were like the, the one that, you know, was my, like my brothers, you know. Um, it was just so amazing because their support gave me so much hope and motivation to fight and fight for what's right. So I definitely give a lot of great credit to my teammates. It seems like people who move here from countries that are not free appreciate the freedoms here much more than a lot of us who grew up with those freedoms. Does, have you noticed that? You know, I feel like I'm going to just say this and I'm going to be honest. People should feel really blessed and lucky to be in this, be in, be in America because you know, they love to criticize it, but when you live a country like Turkey or, or, you know, China or somewhere else, you will appreciate the freedoms you have here. Yes. You know, that is exactly so I feel like they should just, please, they, they, they should just keep their mouth shut and stop criticizing the greatest <laughs> nation in the world. Wait, and wrong. they should focus on, you know, the, their freedoms and their human, human rights and their uh, democracy. So this is, America gave me everything I have. So I, I definitely appreciate uh, the United States of America. That's how I feel. We're putting up a picture of one of your sneakers on the screen here. Tell us what this is. What's, what's on there? <laughs> Uh, I cannot see the picture right now, but if you tell me what it is, I will tell you the story about it. Yeah, wait, wait, wait. it's kind of uh, sad. Oh my God. I mean, well, all right, I just want to say this: he he has been through a lot, and like again, these are athletes; they're not, you know, you right. don't want to. They're they're not politicians, but the when he says there that people should just be grateful, I'm not sure if he knows what he's saying, but he plays on a lot uh, on a team with a lot of, uh, you know, or in a league where a lot of black players have spoken out about. Black Lives Matter and other issues like that. Um, so 
to me the, the what, what what tucker's trying to use him for there is essentially to say my kind of political activism is meaningful and the right kind as opposed to lebron james who should just shut up and dribble everyone I mean should just shut up the way that Erdogan made my father shut up and me shut up. What kind of hypocrisy is this? I love the idea yeah. of like people need to appreciate their freedom and shut up and not talk <laughs> about critiquing things. But I also like I was just sitting there watching Tucker Carlson talk to mm. this immigrant who has become a citizen and thought, mm -hmm. like, hmm. <laughs> how many times has uh, Tucker said that immigrants are making us dirtier? and uh immigration is bad and they're um the the democrats are trying to refashion the voting public by allowing immigrants in uh i didn't see any of that in that in but those are the Weird. wrong kind of immigrants right if only we only allowed more ennis Cantor freedoms into this country then we would be pure as snow here in the United right. States. That's like, you know, what he we wants need to, to allow tall, strapping uh, young men to come in. Tall, Not strapping today. millionaires who love America and only wear U.S. citizen shirts. Yeah. Grateful. I mean, Wait, is this like a turn for him? Like, is he no longer, uh, you said that his career is not where it used to be. Is this, yeah, uh, there was no. an opportunity that he couldn't resist kind of thing? I, I mean, look, I think that's the thing that's tough about this is like, even if his intentions are good, he's, sw he's swimming in these with sharks that are absolute and he's become one of their school. Right. And yeah. it is the case that like his, his basketball career is over. He can't, he couldn't get time with the Celtics. He's just at, at age 30, like he's, he was never that great of a player to begin with. And he's kind of do the next thing now. And you know, I, I think like he, you could believe that this is with the re best of intentions, but like, it sucks that it's gone the way of, Hey, uh, shut up about criticizing this country. Cause I think, I think activism, I think it is probably better, uh, aimed at the governments that most responsible to you. And then, you know, trying, I, I think like the, the China stuff with everyone saying like, Hey, LeBron, shut up and dribble unless it's to talk about China. That's basically like the Republican line on this stuff. And well, I mean, this is what's so weird to me is, is you have the like the supposed pseudo non-imperialist left. I, they're silent on this one. You know, they're the ones who deny that there's a genocide, that Chinese are committing a genocide. They're the ones who, you know, deny other uh, yet like they go on Tucker. I mean, are they are they supporting what Tucker's saying here that he's endorsing what what this guy is saying? I, that's what I don't get. Like, is Glenn Greenwald um, supportive of, of this? Genocide denier? Hi, I no? mean all I have, when the guy put up the, the sneakers, I got a real my pillow qu a vibe. The whole thing. I thought there was going to be a coupon code. Well, I mean, there's like uh, in other Tucker segments, it may have been in that segment, ads for Tucker's merch. So they could really do, you know, what you love is a shortened Tucker Carlson link where it would go straight to Annis Cantor's sneaker shop. There you go. You should really write a children's book. A uh, couple more IMs. Godcat, if I'm going to fly all the way to Boston in the dead of winter on a shoestring, this creeper is going to need at least a few minutes to meet and greet with y'all. <laughs> uh, fact finder, is Nomiki going to the live show? The fans want Nomiki. She should. Oh, hey. She should sing? sing. Oh, no, this is somebody who listens to my Instagram. I've been singing on my Instagram lately. What? Really? Not, I was drunk. It was Thanksgiving. Come on, guys. Oh, we had oh. a sing along. People stayed until five. I hosted Thanksgiving with 20 people and they stayed until 5, 530 in the morning uh, singing. Yeah. Colin from Nebraska. Sam, both my parents tested positive for COVID. My mom is vaccinated, but only because I thankfully convinced her back in July. My dad is definitely going to be emboldened to not get the vaccine even more now if he gets uh, antibodies, if he does. And as of now, my mom has felt worse than him. I mean, you're right. The only way to get unvaccinated people to get shot uh, is to making their lives a tiny bit more difficult to... Trans well, and they're saying just just to, clar to clarify, they're saying as of right now that antibodies it doesn't matter with this new variant. Like, you know, the the, the your the effects at least are still going to be minimized with the vaccine if you get this new variant. But the antibodies will not make a difference as of right now with their understanding. Yeah, I think we need a couple more weeks to get a better sense of of all that stuff with Omicron. But uh... no, 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 Omicron. Omicron. <laughs> Uh, trance warfare. Why does he go by H. John Benjamin and not Harry J. Benjamin? Hmm. 
Uh, maybe we will be the opportunity to ask. Uh, Ad hurts off. Um, what is the most su surprising celebrity personality you can remember? I.e., person who seems nice but is a dick. Person who seems like an asshole but is nice. Gary Busey seems like such a sweetheart, right? But when you yeah. met him, he was a sweetheart. The, no, the, there's no. I've never been surprised. <laughs> really? You said Bradley Cooper was a nice guy. But I would. Does but he I, seem like an asshole? Brad, Does he? Before he was I don't know. famous. He, well, so. he's a big star, so maybe that's I, why I was not it might surprised be surprising. Um, no, he was very, I mean, I, I haven't seen him in a long time, but very nice guy. Um, let's see. Does Jim it have to be, can it like? She is exactly as you would imagine. Okay. But worse. Um, what about politicians? Do those count as celebrities and like hosts? Because that's an easy one, like. Are you going to name names? Who? No, I'm just saying, like, Sam, like, I'm sure there's, well, yes, I can name names, but, but I'm sure there's, I mean, there's, in that industry, there's a lot of people who on air are complete nightmares and off air are, like, genuinely nice and just full of shit. Um, I, I can't think of anybody who I was, like, surprised was different than, than my, my conception of them beforehand. <laughs> Honestly, I mean, um, but I can't remember anything. <laughs> but, Sam Cedar is kind of an asshole off air. I'm not going to lie. Off air, I mean, I, I, people would be surprised how I act out. <laughs> like, actually, really? I, you're the same. Like, uh, Sam is basically who I thought he was before I worked for him. Um, same with, like, Alex Perrine. Like, most people I knew about before, they, uh, yeah, basically, basically makes sense who they are. Yeah, but I don't know if, like, Perrine and I are famous yeah, people. Pretty, <laughs> yeah. Pretty famous on... Circles. Am I am I different off air? Don't say it. Pretty intolerable off air. Yeah, yeah obviously. <laughs> She's a nightmare. She's such a diva, guys. I will only drink out of this mug, and if you touch it, the best is watching Bradley have to set up each one of her cashews. <laughs> Line in front of uh, in, in... yeah, you really fucked up the other day. <laughs> <laughs> on air, they have to stand up. They have to stand up on her desk. The cashews. <laughs> it doesn't even matter. The honestly, cashews cannot go sideways. They he... need to actually be all like balanced, like an egg on like the equinox. Or he knocked it, it over. He doesn't even. I mean, like honestly, I think the audience would be on my side with this, Bradley, because that's your job. I regret the error. Yeah, I mean, you should. God damn it. Uh, this is going to, uh, I'm trying to think, maybe uh, Marin, Mark Marin, mm -hmm. turns out to be a little bit self-involved. Oh. Yeah. What about Heidecker? You know, Heidecker, I, 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 I've never really, I mean, I've interacted with him, but not, you know, I mean, that guy is repulsive, I think, what he's doing right now with his latest show. Have people seen this? Yeah, I think. He's I going mean... out there and pushing all sorts of uh, crab ice, uh, crab, um, crab salt uh, theories that are completely half baked. People should go check out the uh, Heidecker's latest show. It's just, it's really, uh, it's amazing. Irresponsible. It's incredibly irresponsible. Yeah, he should be deplatformed. It's it's unbelievable. I, I called it with Heidecker a long time ago. What's crab salt? Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, you know, he and... says it's. <laughs> Here's COVID. I and I'm so confused, guys. He opted this whole thing where he names himself after a philosopher. It's really wrong. I, I, I just, uh, it's wrong. Uh, um, Weird ha that hating on Meghan McCain is sexist, but man Mangina is cool. Just trying to figure out Nomi's rules. Well, um said that. Well, it wasn't about Meghan McCain. It was about The View and kind of what they're, and I think you're missing the point, the institution of The View and thank you guys, like we got a lot of messages from people who did get it. The institution of The View is about putting women against each other, pitting women against each other, shout at each other. And it reinforces a lot of negative stereotypes. And also it's not an equal distribution of like what women believe because there's actual left that's left out and that those who are on the left are Hollywood. So think about those narratives. ABC is a very conservative network and they think about these things. Mangina is, goes back to the original conversation if you had watched it about the P. So if you watch that, you'll, you'll know. Psychophile. Hey yeah, Sam, this is Mangina Tess. in like ten years. I feel like that was a bully, like something you'd say in middle school to bully somebody. Okay, go on. No, because it gets under his skin. You know that. It does get. Uh, where does the voicemail go when the phones aren't open yet? Uh, it goes to voicemail. I don't know what. Um, uh, 
Ryan Cole, wait, wait, wait. Hyenas are scavenger carnivores that, uh, like all African meat eaters, follow the herd animals. Gorillas are predominantly herbivores living in the mountainous highlands. They're n they are both African. Coconuts are not indigenous to Africa. Oh. Dana needs to take a class. <laughs> Well, of course, they buy their coconuts from their, you know, to, well, the alligators they, ship the coconuts from across the ocean. Well, they've got the coconut cannon. So what are they supposed to put in it? Bananas? I mean, come on. <laughs> um, I mean, this world still exists in like the supply chain. Uh, so, of course, they're going to get those imported. Ryan Cole, Don Rickles was a sweetheart in real life. That is true. <laughs> yes. Uh, nobody knows who that is. MR Neutron. What are you talking about? Okay. Oh, come on. MR Neutron. Hi, Sam. Can we get a belated show far from my wife's best uh, best buddy, Zooey the Cat? Oh. Uh, we lost her the day before Thanksgiving a year ago. Thoroughly effing already after holiday season. Now it's coming around again and she's still badly missed. This goes out to the cat. Zooey. Act is in. Hey, Sam. As dumb as Danny Bongos is, he did nail the pronunciation of Nomiki's name. Well, whatever. <laughs> surprise too <laughs> or dan bongo <laughs> patrick that's how you get up the facebook charts patrick from worcester i visited paris earlier this month everyone was masked indoors and on mass transit no issue at all my only question is why would you go to uh paris when you live in worcester the paris of the <laughs> <laughs> all right 10 more of these and then we're out of here. North Dakota nurse. My nine-year-old got her second COVID shot today. Meanwhile, our school district has decided to stop requiring masks in school. Today, our state has a 10.8 positivity rate. What could go wrong? Additionally, during the most recent shift I worked at the hospital, our uh, pediatric unit was completely full with four kids and overflow mm -hmm. on an adult unit. Healthcare workers here are so burnt out, but nobody cares. It's... Uh, uh, I'm Jammer Sammy. If you have to soften the guns to coconut cannons to make it child friendly, you've already conceded that guns are distasteful and not suitable for children. What more is there to say? That's right. Normalize guns. Why not have the kids firing actual weapons? The, the, the hyenas. Why do you think Crowder wears a holster? I know. Exactly. I want to see the gorilla packing. Eat. All right. We're at two. Here's number three. Uh, Avelina Garcias. In reality, a lot of these conservatives would love for hyenas to play with their coconuts. Okay. Number four. <laughs> Don't even know what that. Uh, That's gross. Mind guy. One of the TV's most influential death cult supporters, Dr. Oz, is running for the U.S. Senate in Pennsylvania as a Republican. He last went viral in April 2020, saying that Hannity, that reopening schools in the United States might be worth the increased number of deaths it could cause. It sounds like he'll be a lock for the GOP. I wonder, uh, like, what his uh, chances are. I, I mean, I... He hasn't officially announced, though, has he? Well, I think he did today. Oh, he did today? I think... Oh, I think he has very strong chances. I mean, I'm not necessarily, like, advocating. I... He's a very... Actually... He is a guy, very, very nice in person. And I think it's extremely dangerous. He's very, like how he is on screen, very, very, very nice in person. Like moms love him. I think it's dangerous. Wyoming Ryan, here in Yellowstone, no one is watching Yellowstone. It's a <laughs> EW written drama show with our fantastic backgrounds that comes at the perfect time that a third of the country is missing Trump in the good old days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean... I get bad vibes from the show, but I, you know. If I was uh, from Montana, I'd also probably avoid it like I uh, avoided Fargo because I was from North Dakota. Oh. Sam looks like a professor from ha a Harry Potter novel today with the haircut glasses. Yeah, I'm sorry. He's not wearing a robe, uh, so that's not true. Leaker. Most Republicans are still firmly in the Trump camp. The more reasonable Republicans are a large, not a large number of people. Fox News is giving the audience what they want. Wayne Kerr, can we stop using the rights uh, language? All immunity is natural. There is vaccine-induced natural immunity and infection-induced natural immunity. Fair enough. Jonathan Armstead, Tucker asked, are your teammates as grateful to be Americans as you are? Which goes back to the standard trope that black folk aren't happy. Yeah. For all that's happened to us after slavery, this guy has turned the dog whistle into a hip-hop horn. Jay Chavone, rest assured, Marjorie Taylor Greene took Nancy Mace to task for her fancy footwork. 
And the final I am of the day. Hey. Left is the best. Here we go. The hyenas got the cannon for the roasters south of the river. So the next series will be about securing the river. <laughs> Matt, Bradley, Nomi, Emma, great job today. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye. It might take all the strength I got to get to where I want. But I know somehow I'm going to get there. I wasn't looking when I just got caught Between the truth and the lie